Good morning, everyone. How are you? How's everyone today? It's a beautiful day. I'm Andrew Andrews. I'm your Master of Ceremonies today um, for this RIMPA Information Awareness Month Building Trust and Information Seminar here in Adelaide at the beautiful State Library here. Um, we've got an action-packed day, lots of great speakers, lots of energy in the room. We hope you get lots of benefit out of it and uh, out of today's session. And um, if there's one wish I have for us here today is that you all get inspired to do something with the knowledge that you learn today and be inspired to take it into your workplaces and make, make a change with what you've learned from today. So let's do this, guys. So. So to get us kicked off for this morning, we've got Jeff Strimple. He's the Director of State Library of South Australia for the official event opening and the welcome. Welcome to Jeff. For the intro, I'm just getting the technology organised. Great. I think we're good to go. Welcome everybody, it's lovely to see you here. Um, I would like you to, to welcome you here to the State Library and just give you a bit of background about this building and the other two that make up our network of buildings for the State Library. If you've not been here before, you're actually currently sitting or standing in the Institute building. This building was opened 25 years after the province of South Australia was declared. So um, white arrival and declaration of some sort of a British uh, province in 1836. By 1861, there had been this building had been opened and it was really the centre of arts and culture, science and learning. Um, it was the first public cultural building here in the state and it remains part of our network and we're delighted to have it. Um, it's uh, overdue for a bit of a reno but uh, hopefully that's coming. Um, you will may also have noticed and if you look through the windows you'll be able to see across the way the Mortlock building. Mortlock building was opened in 1881. You can see that there was a bit more money in the province by this stage and so there was a slightly larger and, and uh, more ornate building. Um, that lot building across the way features in many of the top 20 most beautiful libraries in the world etc. So if you haven't been in there go and have a look. Um, we get a lot of people coming in and the first thing they say to us is where's the Harry Potter building? Um, it does look a little bit like that and it's certainly worth checking out if you haven't been there. And in the middle that connects the two here is the Spence building that was originally built in the 18th 1960s and then refurbed in 2002. Um, please, when you get a bit of a break, you won't want to be stuck in here all day, so take some time and go for a wander. Um, I uh, thought I would, of course, uh, commence by acknowledging that we're meeting on the lands of the Ghana people here in Adelaide. They're people who have managed to keep their own knowledge and wisdom alive for over 60,000 years without pencils and paper and computers. So their ability to manage knowledge and information has been spectacular compared to some of the efforts that we've made. I know that we are gonna have a welcome to country and that's most appropriate. The Ghana people uh, welcome us here on their lands uh, in a moment or two. Um, I, I would like to uh, look at the theme for today about building trust in information. Um, and I took this from the website that particularly said that we're provo provoking a deep dive into the importance of trust in information across all aspects of business and life, from the people to the technology. And most importantly, that we don't um, overemphasize each of those two legs. They're both as important as they are uh, as each other. Um, the technology is the enabler, but it's the people who really make things work. I won't run through all the program today. I know that Simon's going to do that shortly in his presentation. So I'd like to just move on to a couple of discussion starters for today. Um, I think most of us all know that um, DIKW pyramid, the one that goes that says there's lots of data that with some degree of effort we transfer it into knowledge, then into wisdom, uh, into, sorry, into information and wisdom, and then finally uh, uh, wisdom. I'll get it right in a minute. Um, the interesting thing is this hierarchy isn't a guarantee. We almost think that if we collect enough data, we'll eventually be wise. Uh, but I'd have to say that when you look around us at the moment, and uh, here's a political statement for the day, I think we're drowning in data about understanding our, our world. But from my point of view, we seem to have sim be significantly wanting in wisdom around such existential issues as climate change. However, Saturday night might have made a bit of a, a dent in that. Who knows what happens? 
Um, but it is interesting to think that we are the keepers of, of data and we're the keepers of information, but there almost appears to be this threshold that where does information transfer over into knowledge that people use to make a difference in their life. And from my point of view, we are those keepers in that special place of that bottom half of the pyramid. But I think we also have a place to play as we move into that more sophisticated area of, of knowledge. How do we help practitioners and subject matter experts to get to our information in a way that it is they can trust it for a start, but also that they can use it to create the knowledge that does make a difference in our society. We are, after all, uh, claiming that we're a knowledge economy. Some of us are venturing into that space already and here in South Australia I'm delighted to say that the State Records and ourselves and the History Trust are working with the University on an ARC linkage grant which is looking back in time at the conflict on the settlements of South Australia as white colonisation spread across the, the state, now the state. Um, what impact did that have on Aboriginal communities? And going back to original sources that we hold and other people hold and re-looking them at them through a different lens, we as the holders of the knowledge are working with the subject matter experts and our collections are being enriched in that interplay with the experts who know something about it. We're adding things back into our original collection because of our ability to work with those people in a, in a very positive way. Um, I would also just like to say, um, I'm talking to the staff at the Adelaide University Library a little later today. And one of the thoughts I'm going to be exploring with them, I'd share with you today as well, because perhaps it's one of those um, challenges for us as we, are, as we stand here on the threshold of, I think, some really huge breakthroughs in how information and data can be used in different ways. Um, there are now supercomputers that can now look across huge data sets and bring out of those data sets information that the human brain can't see the patterns of. And we've got to that stage where human intellect and ability is being outstripped by the machines that we're building to do that. And I think that's one of the really interesting challenges for us. We have these massive data sets um, and often we'll have people who have written a conclusion about a data set and that's a, a, a professional opinion using that data. But we're now seeing, particularly in the health industry, um, setting loose computers across huge data sets and drawing conclusions about some patterns that are forming. And then, of course, there's the human intellect then looks at it and says, is this correlational or is it causational or is it just accidental? Um, and that's where the human intellect comes back into the equation to do that sort of stuff. So as the, as the holders of this data, as the holders of the original sources of information, we do hold the fundamental building blocks for where we're going next on using our machine learning to be able to give us some interpretations of what we hold. And we will often be surprised by the sorts of things that we come out of it. So this poses a bit of an interesting problem for us. There's ethical dilemmas built up in this in terms of letting computers roam free across data that we've held for particular reasons and with a particular legal or other mandate that we're holding onto this information. So there are still some interesting ethical and interesting areas of exploration about our professions and how we intersect with where people want to take our data into the future. So I apologise, I won't be staying today. I do have a couple of things on. Um, so I just want to say to you, as you delve into your theme today of building trust in information, I hope that this will be a day that both confirms that we're doing really good things, but also challenges us to think about our future in this ever-changing space of being the custodians of the information and the data that is the baseline for who we are as a, as a society. Um, and at that point, I'd like to say thank you. Great to see you here in Adelaide. Those have come from a slightly further afield. Lovely to have, see a few familiar faces in the audience. And I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, thank you Jeff. Uh, I'd like to, uh, just, just before we kick off with the welcome to country, I'd like to just acknowledge the collaborative bodies that have been involved in the making of today's event, the ASA, ALIA, RIMPA, of course, Dharma, HIMA, NAA, and in New Zealand Archives. And I also want to acknowledge our sponsors, very important um, group of people who have helped us make this happen today. Our platinum sponsor is Actinav, and they're the live streaming sponsor. Our gold sponsor is NAA Panel, and they're sponsoring the discussion panel. 
we've also got get it right I've lost the paper I'll, I'll do the other sponsors later just look. see this is this is the problem with paper we lose things so there's another piece of paper on the table there so We'll get to that. We'll get to the rest of the sponsors a bit later. So let me um, let me welcome uh, Katrina Cal Cal Calapina Power, who's doing the welcome to country. Could you please welcome her? these English accessories. Kamami tamano tamamu nankada naichali napada kaunu yakana yunga. Namani badni tindan yanga bim bim balya bukiana gana. Nainari Katanya Katrina Galabina the lover of fire. Marende Nakonde Nanyawaya there, Nyatu Karolta Minala. Grandmothers, grandfathers, mothers, fathers, aunties, uncles, sisters, and brothers. Today we come to sit and stand as the Ghana do in sacred Ghana land. Stolen Ghana land. Land that has never been surrendered. We pay our respects to all the Ghana that were, all the Ghana that are, and all the Ghana that will be. We pay our respects to all our elders, black, white, red, yellow, and rainbow. Um, I'll be making quite a few political statements today. Jack, I was born political. Yeah? So I've never accessed any records. And this invitation excites me no end. I'm a dinosaur, a technological dinosaur. Some might argue it's my, my act of resistance. I'll leave it to those who choose to argue. Anyway, I stand firm. This is just concrete. That is just concrete. That is just concrete. It doesn't matter how old the building is or how long you've been sitting on it or how many generations there's been. It's Ghana country. I'm the first born and seventh generation of, Ghana, of Wanganines. If someone can tell me something a bit more about that, I'll be really wrapped. I've got a photo of my grandparents from 1857 in Victorian clothes. You know what my, my daughter and my granddaughters and grandsons? They ain't wearing these things where you suffocate and hang yourself every day. We're reclaiming our fur. We're reclaiming our feathers, our ochre, our red gum, and we're doing it our way. Let's hear it for the greens and the teals. Yes? I want the men to clap louder. This is a woman's thing. And let me tell you, I don't care how many women in the South Australian Parliament, I won't be celebrating until there's a black woman in Parliament. I'm about to return, Jeff, and I'm telling you, I ain't going to stand back while you mob watch all the men do the welcomes. It ain't happening. 
I don't care if you're the white patriarchy or the black patriarchy. I'm a goddess and I'm a global sister. Yeah? Anyway, I just want to, in terms of ethics and protocols, and when we have first contact, which is my first contact with Jeff, guess what? Power doesn't in, does not intimidate me or impress me. I want someone to do a favour for me. On Anzac Day 2017, I got told I had two minutes to do an Anzac welcome on the dawn service. I hijacked it for 14 minutes. And all the, every single defence force around me, and none of them could take me down. That's how serious I am about gender equity, and I'm calling out the white women too. Look in your records. You'll see Penny Wong, Julia Gillard, who are both migrants, freely educated at the University of Adelaide. One's the poster girl for Prime Minister, the other one's the poster girl for LGBTIQ community. She was raised by a white mother. Julie Bishop was also educated freely at the University of Adelaide. That's your three top women in the country. Okay? We've got to do something about that, white women. And black women are never going to have the numbers. And stats tell me most of you are likely to outlive me. I haven't got time to waste. I'm excited about Aboriginal people getting supported as allies from white people. You mob have the skills. You mob have the knowledge. Okay? Help ground Aboriginal people. Because white fellas have been grounding us in cement for too long. Be an ally. I think I'm, I'm wrapped about the commitment to the Uluru Statement from the heart. But I'll tell you about the statement of, from the heart and another story. On International Women's Day, I, I called Malcolm Turnbull cow shit. This will be another story for that if you can get all the media that went with it. I called him Matt cow shit for ignoring the Uluru Statement to the heart. The first thing the Albanese government has done I'm not giving Pop Wong any credit, and I'll tell you why, and I'll feel this way till there are days no more. I give it to Malcolm Turnbull. I hijacked a welcome. And I got refused entry before I even went in there, and I was treated like a piece of shit, which is what most Aboriginal people feel. The fear that Aboriginal people will feel before we even come and ask, what is our history? Don't underestimate that. Please don't underestimate that. And don't underestimate my commitment to partnerships and equality and truth and justice and treaty. Penny Wong, without even asking me what happened, in a page three story on the advertiser, attacked an Aboriginal woman on International Women's Day to call a Malcolm Turnbull cow shit. I said, you turn cow shit, Malcolm Turnbull. You've got no heart. Let's get on with this now we've got a new government. Australia's embryonic. I don't know what your records say, but we've been here for at least 60,000 years. You've been here for 230 years. We ain't ever going to be sheep that change the system. Okay? Because I'd rather be a koala than a sheep. But let me say this in the family history. I don't care how many generations you've been here for. Captain Cook bought rabbits. They've been breeding ever since. That don't make them koalas. Yeah? A rabbit is a rabbit is a rabbit is a rabbit. Anyway, <coughs> that's enough from me. But I wanted to pull you up, Jeff. No business gets done until the welcome's done. No themes and no things explained. I speak truth, I speak truth to power. That's why you'll never see any awards for me. I'm not for sale. I'm interested in truth, justice, partnerships, and remembering we all want the same things for our children. Don't let your grandchildren be arguing with my grandchildren about whether we should change the dates. It's a no-brainer, isn't it? It really is. Anyway, 
I've been on my high emu long enough. I don't speak to impress or entertain. And if you never hear from another Aboriginal woman again, be sure to remember this Garner grandmother because there's plenty of evidence that I'll leave behind that I was a resistant fighter. I know it. My ancestors know it. So let us sit and talk together. Let us eat and drink together. Let us sing and dance together and let us laugh and cry together so that our children and their children's children can feel the wind and the breeze find shelter in the storm and sunshine in the rain, but most especially that all these babies, this generation and all the generations to come, can feel the warmth of a true campfire, a truth campfire, stoked with truth, that they can feel love and hope and healing. Because you know what? That's what this planet needs. We're on this camp together. I need you to help me stoke it, ignite it, and action. Don't waste my time being sorry and guilty. Do better as you can. Natalia, thank you. So I wanted to acknowledge uh, on exit that um, Katrina is a proud Ghana woman, mother and grandmother. She's a journalist and a native therapist and an artist. And we very much thank her for her welcome. So thank you. Our next, um, our next um, segment is um, Director General of the National Archives of Australia, Simon Freud. I hope I've got it right. Uh, he's doing a virtual welcome. It's his first day in Canberra, so we thought we'd do it virtually. Good morning. Thank you for joining us for this year's Information Awareness Month and today's event, Building Trust in Information. Welcome to those who are joining us in person for today's launch in Adelaide and also to those of you from across Australia and New Zealand who are joining us virtually. My name is Simon Froude and I am, as of an hour or two ago, the Director General of National Archives of Australia. Prior to that, I was Director of State Records of South Australia since 2015, where I had responsibility for records and archives, information privacy and freedom of information. Whilst I would have liked to have been there in person to host today's event, I'm sure you'll understand my reasons for not attending. Information Awareness Month is a great opportunity for the records, archives, library, information and data communities to come together and it is a testament to our shared passion and beliefs that we see so many here today. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land we meet on today is the traditional land of the Ghana people and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to pay my respects to all Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander and First Nations people joining us today. I'd also like to thank the State Library of South Australia for hosting us today in the fabulous Institute building, one of the iconic buildings of North Terrace here in Adelaide. We have a wonderful day ahead of us today with a programme packed full of excellent and provocative speakers. We commence with an intriguing panel discussion led by Susan Bennett, where Peter Worthington Eyre, Helena Nopko and James Price will discuss what we mean by trusted information and why it is important. We then have a distinctly National Archives flavour with Tatiana Ansipova talking about NAA's building trust in the public record, followed by insights from my predecessor at NAA, David Fricker. The use and misuse of information will be discussed by Tanya Reid, Andrew McAllendon and Mark Mackey before Kylie Percival gives us a presentation from Arlia. We then turn our attention to the role empathy plays in delivering data governance before having a conversation with Lana Lutman about information professionals and careers in the industry. Dr Jenny Caruso will then discuss trust in archives from the perspective of Aboriginal people before we bring the day to a close with Anne Cornish discussing the need for information practitioners to be heard 
And finally, Nicola Laurent will host a panel discussion around turning conversation into action. I'm sure that you will leave today full of ideas and renewed passion. Trust plays a significant part in our lives. Trust in people, trust in technology, trust in governments. This year's theme, Building Trust in Information, focuses on the importance of trusted information and the importance of that to enabling informed decisions. We've seen recently through the pandemic heightened awareness within the community about how governments and organisations manage their information. Never before has the trust we place in these institutions been under such a spotlight. Questions have been asked about who has access to information, how long it'll be retained for, what it might be used for, how does the technology, the policy and the practice support a trusted environment. As professionals in information, we are at the vanguard of ensuring that the information within our organisations can be trusted. We need to make sure that we have the capacity and capability to fulfil our responsibilities and we need to ensure that we are part of the conversation. Trust in information starts before a piece of information is created and in some instances is relied upon long after its initial use may have ceased. Information that can be trusted is critical for understanding our past, delivering our present and protecting our future. I hope you all have an enjoyable day. Thank you. Thank you to Simon. Um, next up, we've got Anthony Moss uh, from New Zealand. He's um, from Archives New Zealand and he's doing his welcome over Teams. I've actually got the paper now, so I can actually um, use this, uh, this quiet time to talk about our sponsors. So our sponsors are uh, Platinum Sponsors, ActiveNav, who's doing the live streaming. Gold sponsor is um, NAA Panel, for the NAA Panel, um, which is coming up. Our silver sponsors are CompuStore for sponsoring David Fricker. TIMG are sponsoring lunch very important. Our bronze, sponsor, uh, bronze, bronze sponsors are Fujifilm, Record Solution and FYB. Now, I didn't mention um, housekeeping. I should have mentioned that right off the bat. The toilets are out, out and to the right of the seminar room. There's a disabled toilet facility to the left. The sponsors have their trade displays set up in the institute room where we're going to have lunch. And um, food and beverage services will be provided there. That includes morning tea, lunch, 
and the network of tricks. Always very important. So uh, that's all my paperwork done. I'll be doing more of those sponsorship announcements during the day as well. Thank you very much. Anthony, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear. Okay. We need to make sure that we can see you. Oh, he's here. Go ahead. Thank you. I can hear you, yep. Hi, good morning. Hi, I can hear you. Right, good morning. Good morning, Adelaide. Hi. <laughs> It's Tony Moss. Yeah. Uh, I'm not as advertised the acting chief archivist in New Zealand. I apologise for that. Um, my role here is uh, director of government record keeping at archives uh, New Zealand. So um, standing in for our acting chief archivist um, this morning. And apologies for any intermittent noise that might come into my building, uh, uh, this meeting room, because. The good news is we've got a new repository being built over the road. It gets a bit noisy at um, times. Um, shall I continue? Yes. <laughs> Thanks for the chance to just uh, to, to say hi to uh, our colleagues uh, at, at uh, this event. Um, just looking through the, the topics for today's session, um, you know, building trust and information, absolutely a, 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 an idea that resonates, uh, you know, across the, the professions across, across the world. Um, but looking at today's sessions, it seemed to me that there might be an additional uh, layer of um, to the, the usual trust proposition that IM professionals offer, or perhaps there, there is already or should should be in the future. Not just the classic, um, are the records trustworthy? Do they have integrity? Where are they from? Um, 
although that's of course continues to be challenging enough with the immense volume of information and the frighteningly convincing faked information that technology now allows um it seems to me that there's an additional trust uh, layer trust proposition that perhaps the, the professional uh, uh, IM professionals need to be able to assure uh, the rest of humanity about and that is how and when and how much can we trust the machines um, you know in organizations of even moderate complexity um, we're well past the stage where human beings can actually actively manage the entire volume of information that we generate uh, and acquire so um, so that's my idea but maybe the extra layer of trust that um, our occupations need to be offering is the question of can can we trust the machines and how much questions like you know when we buy uh, 365 are we buying all the right bits and are we getting the, the components that we need um, to ensure that we have some hope of understanding the value of our information and managing it effectively or uh, how do we record for accountability purposes and for historical reuse Uh, what goes on, or, you know, how do we set and monitor the tolerances that we're going to have to develop um, for the over and under retention when um, all our sentencing is uh, automated as it has to be if we're to get any of it done. So uh, perhaps some of the sessions today will will traverse some of those those topics. That's that's my observation. I don't know whether. Uh, audience participation empathy session would generate some answers maybe that's the best approach <laughs> but um i think um yeah i just throw that out there as, a, as, a, as an idea about what is what is the trust proposition for uh, information management uh, professionals in the, in the situation we're at the moment um thanks again for the opportunity to talk to you all Thank you, we got there. So, thank you very much. So, we've got our first panel session uh, for this morning. It's uh, facilitated by Susan Bennett, from, who's the CEO of InfoGov ANZ. Um, the, the speakers are Peter Worthington Eyre, who's the Chief Data Officer, Executive De Director for Office of Data Analytics, SA Government. Helen Onomko, oh, I hope I spelled that right, um, said that right. On Nomco, who's thank you, who's uh, from Rimpa, South Australian Northern Territory branch, and and James Price, managing director of Experience Matters. The topic is digital transformation and trusted information, the future of informa information professionals. Can you please welcome them to the to the panel? Thank you. Okay, thank you. I can. Yes, thank you. Hopefully we're all in the uh, right positions. <laughs> so um, it's terrific to be here today. Um, it's a very uh, exciting and interesting topic, a uh, trust in information. And we're kicking off the first panel session this morning talking about the digital transformation and the role of trusted information. And I'm delighted to welcome the Chief Data Officer for South Australia, Peter Worthington Ayres, um, James Price, who many of you know, who's uh, very experienced, more than 30 years experience in information and data, and uh, chairs a data governance uh, leaders organisation as well. And of course, Helen Anopko, um, who's got more than 40 years experience in records and information management throughout Australia and uh, the, a, the South Pacific region, both in uh, government and in corporate. So I'm looking forward to a uh, interesting uh, and stimulating discussion today. If the audience has questions, please put up your hand and uh, I'll incorporate those 
into the discussion as well. So digital transformation. Uh, certainly, you know, we've been talking about digital transformation for a decade now. Um, you know, the move into the fourth industrial revolution. But certainly uh, COVID sped up the digital transformation. And I know uh, Peter has led an amazing response here in South Australia uh, to the data analytics, uh, the data government sharing um, in relation to the response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And it's interesting, I think, to reflect now that we're two years into the pandemic response on uh, what we've learnt, um, how uh, you've gone about that here in South Australia and what are some of the learnings in relation to uh, trusted information in relation to data for good, uh, data to help uh, public health um, and to manage a pandemic response. Um, there's a lot in that. Happy to still have time, but look, um, I, I think COVID has shown us that we can work together. I think first and foremost, and it really was a big public trust exercise that I think um, all the South Australians and all Australians put a lot of trust in government with things like QR codes, um, and there's a lot of privacy protections that we put in place over the top of that to um, reciprocate that trust. Um, some of which is very hard to communicate to people, uh, but as we move into that digital world, I think. Um, it's really important to show value, and my fundamental principle is there's got to be something in it. There's got to be something in it. If there's not, then these things won't work. Uh, and whether that's records in a digital system that people put in, they need to be able to get some value out of that. It's not like we're dealing with papers. Andrew experienced this morning. Um, we're actually creating records digitally, which means that people then expect some benefit back. And what we showed, I guess, through COVID is we can compress a whole bunch of that into a short time. Um, I think we built the QR system in about three weeks. Um, and we had all the legal issues around that and we used that effectively a lot behind the scenes, which people didn't even know, um, to, uh, I guess, monitor the situation, lock things down. And I think we had one of the best responses to that in the world because we had such a good analytics capability. Um, and just to give you an idea of, of that, I think every state says it does best, and it's best, so I'm not going to say that. But um, but we we had the ability because of the I guess trust that citizens put in the government um, that we had. I think one of the highest QR check-in rates in the country, and that meant that we could lock down people that had flown in from Queensland in the last three days within you know an hour. Um, and I don't think anyone else really had that capability. Mm. On the more broader scale, I, I think there's just some learnings in that from a um, a data for good perspective. One of the things that really concerned me a lot was the non-COVID health issues that were going on in the community, particularly around screening tests, um, people not going to the doctor because they're just presenting people, um, or uh, not going up for eye check checkups and you know, diabetes monitoring and so on. Um, and so I think it certainly surfaced a lot of issues as a country with the three layers of government and how we share that information for good and and also how we can then use the digital channels to communicate with people. And I think what, from my perspective, without going into all the detail, it really highlighted is that we really need a good conversation with the community about consent models and trust. Um, I think health data gets put into this special bucket of it's really sensitive and special, um, but in my world it's just another piece of information. It's, it's what we do with it that's important. And I'm yet to find anyone that said uh, no to the question of, well, can we use your data to save someone's life? Um, but I don't think we've got that framework quite right. So I think that's an interesting point because the uh, Office of the Australian Information Commissioner who runs the community surveys shows consistently when people understand what their data is being used for, particularly for medical and scientific research, um, they are happy to share that information. Uh, but when they don't know, um, they're not happy to share it at all. And so there is that element of uh, trust that's required. And it's interesting that, of course, you've raised the privacy uh, requirements around uh, managing the information. So um, I would be interested in hearing your views on how equipped you were with 
real-time data access in, in the South Australian Government because this is the key, isn't it, moving forward, this issue about uh, if we're going to make uh, good decisions uh, and be in a position to make good decisions, we need to have access to real-time data. Um, look, I think we've got really good capability in that space, but of course there's always a balance between security and accessibility to data. Um, we, we have an incredibly secure environment in which we operate um, and there are lots of controls that obviously I can't talk about in the public domain um, over that data, but that also limits its use. Uh, so I think from a, a real-time perspective, uh, we absolutely had access to a lot of real-time information, um, but did we have every single thing that we needed? Possibly not. Mm. Um, and, and there's lots of reasons for that. I think one we're going to discuss today around trusted information and what that actually means. Mm. Uh, like we do have a lot of information, but what's the quality of that? Mm. Um, and can we rely on it? But the other thing that, as you've probably seen play out now, that we really need to address is identity. Um, what is identity? How is that captured? Um, you know, when I started working, you'd go to the records team, they knew everything, you'd ask for a file on something, it'd be delivered to your desk and everything's in there. Mm -hmm. um, but if you said, can you show me everything on Peter Worthy's now, you couldn't do that because mm -hmm. I'd be in 55 different files, mm -hmm. uh, unless it was a file dedicated for me. Now we've got that data proliferated everywhere, but who am I? On QR check-in, I'm a phone number. Um, with Medicare, I'm a number. Um, with this system, I'm a name, but um, another one is name, date of birth. Mm -hmm. And these were real issues we struggled with um, mm -hmm. through COVID, particularly. Mm -hmm. um, with booking and identity uh, and matching. And I think as we move to that real-time world, we really need to address that so that we're not spending a lot of time doing data linkage mm. um, that we're doing now. Mm. So there's been a lot of work done in South Australia um, on data sharing and data linkage. And James, I know you're uh, a guru in this area around data governance and uh, I see he's looking surprised, but you know. <laughs> um, but what have you seen in the last two years? What has the digital transformation in response to COVID done in relation to this issue around real-time data access and data governance? The pandemic. <laughs> There's always a silver lining. It, it, it has been fantastic. What it has done is um, highlight the critical importance of information. And I don't know for those of you who read um, the business section of the Advertiser on the weekend, uh, there, was a, there was an article in there that um, that some research has been done. A day a week is being wasted because people aren't being effective in a in, in a in a type of environment. So what that's done is essentially really need to get if we are going to to have people working in a hybrid environment, people working from home. And um, PwC did a study uh, last year where, and it was many tens of well, tens of thousands of people who surveyed. Uh, nine percent, nine percent of people who are working um, in, 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 in from home to home want to go back to working full time in an office, which, which means to say that we, as government and business leaders, need to be able to provide an environment in which we can be efficient and effective. And right now we're not, and um, that comes back down to um, which, which, which Jeff was interesting in saying when he was talking about people and the technology. This is a people thing. Yes, yes, the technology is an enabler, but it has to come back down to to, to people and governance and, um, and and frankly corporate discipline because the technology itself cannot do the job. Does that make sense? It's mm. it certainly does, and. Uh, it's interesting, uh, the, I mean, there is no doubt that there have been some silver linings to COVID in relation to the sped up digital uh, transformation that we're undergoing. But this issue about trusted information, access to data. So to James's point, if you're working remotely, uh, how can you be sure that you're accessing the right information uh, and doing it efficiently, to James's point. So Helen, You've had more than 40 years' experience. Uh, you're the guru. <laughs> what is trusted information? And 
what what are the differences around the challenges brought by the digital transformation that we need to uh, be cognizant of in relation to trusted information? Susan? Um, well, yes, as you say, I've worked with uh, predominantly records in various formats for a long time. I, I think we have an increasingly sceptical and untrusting um, society, and that has come through too with the, uh, with the pandemic. Um, they don't trust the statistics. They don't trust the modelling. They ask to see the modelling, society I'm talking about, um, with no... They'll never understand it anyway. It's if you're inside, if you're inside as you work, Peter, all of those um, data analytics, then you have a, a completely different understanding than what society in general has. And I think we are incredibly sceptical, not only brought about by the uh, the pandemic. Um, last year, the former South Australian government, uh, the Liberal government, uh, with the full support of the current Labor government in South Australia, watered down the responsibilities and the, and the powers of our Integrity Commission, our ICAC. Um, and last weekend, this weekend, we have replaced a government um, based largely upon, I believe, uh, one of the three factors was the one of integrity. So, the same people who work, um, all of those elections are people who work in our agencies, our organisations, our businesses. So you can see the trickle-down effect of scepticism, um, of a, a less trusting society. And years ago, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, trusted uh, and really, and, uh, highly regarded uh, record-keeping professional Adrian Cunningham said, records are the currency of democracy and the tools which give us uh, trust through time. And I think it's a very empowering statement. So we have to, in my, in my view, we have to start there. And you can throw all the data you want, you can analyse, you can feel really good about it, but if we're not looking after the records at the beginning of the day, then we haven't come really very far. We are going into agencies now where people are still struggling with what is a record. It's, it's incredible, but it's true. So if you don't know what, you, what records are, the organisation has failed you. They should be articulating what records are, uh, where can we find evidence of our business transactions to give confidence and assurance to our shareholders and the public? Oh, thanks, Helen. There's so many things coming out of that. I think I'll start with uh, the issue about uh, trust and transparency and how we engender that, going back to Peter's point about um, if people, if society needs to trust information, um, how how is that being built? Uh, and we've heard the new uh, Director General uh, for the National Archives just talk about the importance of access to information. Um, in New South Wales, the AI Assurance Framework has just been released in March, uh, which uh, requires all government agencies to um, follow the AI Assurance Framework. And in that, it includes a section on uh, identifying those accountable and responsible um, for decisions made around new technology. But what are some of the ways uh, to that we can actually uh, build um, that trust and transparency, Peter? Give me all the easy questions. Um, <laughs> look, I, I think um, there's some really interesting points there public wanting to see everything um, and the modelling whether they can understand what it actually means. I think we're entering a really odd time that people can Google something and think that they're an expert and that their opinion is equal to someone that spent 35 years of their life studying it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think the battle for building trust and being transparent has changed somewhat in that transparency used to be I can 
access or see all the information that led up to a decision and I can you know, challenge that in question, I can get access to my records and see what they are. Um, but now I think it, it's changed a little bit and one of the things that's always in my mind, particularly around trusted information, is the illusion of completeness with data. Is that we think we've got it all there. Um, and we don't. And I kind of look at it across a framework of there's what really happened, there's a fraction of that gets observed, um, and a fraction of that gets recorded, um, and then some of that then gets interpreted. So we don't really see that whole picture, and, and I think now that we've got a digital sort of transformation underway, people think that all the data they've got is 100%. Um, and when it's not, that's when trust starts to be eroded. Mm. So whether that's something um, like I've put in a freedom of information request and I've got access to my file and there's things missing because I have this email um, and it's not in this file, mm. or it's looking at COVID statistics and, and people saying, well, I don't trust that because um, it changes sort of retrospectively adjusted. Um, so I, I think it's, it's a real challenge right now to be able to mm. do that. There are some constructs, though, that help. So freedom of information is one. Um, open data policies around the country are another. Um, but that also suffers from the same fact that we publish things and do they make sense to people? Are they relevant to them? Um, so it, it's a, I think it's an evolving space. It just, mm -hmm. We need to act, obviously, ethically and honestly. We, we publish lots of things. Um, you could spend your whole life on hand and government websites looking at all the things we publish, but... Is that enough in terms of transparency for the public? I don't know. Mm -hmm. And I'll probably just close with one thing. That with government and trust, if we're always coming from a really low space. So um, I think the, the Commonwealth spent something like $140 million um, on my health record telling people that it's safe. And as far as I know, there's been no data breaches out of that or any information flowed out of that inappropriately. Um, but if you look at, say, Uber, um, where there's been breaches of personal information, on mass and people keep using it. No mm. one's challenging the trust of Uber. Mm. Mm. So we start from a position of scepticism. So we've actually got a higher bar mm. to achieve that trust. I think. Mm. It is interesting though, because I think what the pandemic has shown is that Australians by and large trust governments. Uh, and it's an interesting concept because it's based on nothing having gone wrong or you know not impacting them. Um, so it's important that it, it be maintained. So as information professionals, James, um, how, how is the role of the information professional changing, uh, particularly during this digital transformation? What changes are you seeing and what, what implications does that mean for the information professionals of the future? So, so we're seeing a great deal more interest from executives in managing their information as it will. Um, by that I mean they're, they're thinking about how they manage their, their data, information and knowledge, to, to, use, Jeff's, um, to use Jeff's terms. Um, we've, got to, we've got to manage those data, information and knowledge assets the same, with the same rigour and discipline as that with which we manage our financial assets. Organisations are starting to realise that our information assets have a value, a very significant value. And if you look at some of the work done by people like Ocean, uh, Ocean Tomo out of Chicago, you look at the, the, the value of intangible assets in 1970, in 1974, 17% of the S&P 500 was contributed to by intangible assets, of which data information and knowledge are the significant majority. They redid that piece of work at the, in the middle of 2020. That number is now 90%. So if we don't think that we're living in the knowledge economy, it's time we did. And we need to be able to manage those information assets as well. Now, what does that mean for information professionals? That means to say that we we need to, and if we're going to manage our data information and knowledge the way we manage our money, then the fundamental thing we need is true accountability. True accountability for the quality of the data information and knowledge we right? That means to say that somebody needs to be sacked or rewarded if, if, the, if the information is, is either poor quality or high quality. Without, without that level of, of of accountability, nobody's going to bother. So I was lucky enough to present to the Governance Institute the other day for their Risk and Governance um, uh, conference. I asked, we asked the audience, hands up, all of you who have some sort of information policy, records policy, security policy, whatever, whatever, it, is, whatever it is, almost every hand in the room went up. And 
That's fantastic. And how many of you have a policy, a working organisation, in which that policy is diligently enforced with good behaviour rewarded and bad scope? Not a single hand went up. Now that is just a disgrace. So we, we as, as business leaders, government leaders, we need to understand that our data protection knowledge is a very significant value and that it needs to be, it needs to be carefully matched. And, and there are plenty of examples. Uh, the Cabinet papers from a few years ago where the, 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 the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet sold a couple of uh, filing cabinets. Somebody bought them, drew it out of the locks, found this extraordinary um, material in there, took it to the ABC. The ABC did not disclose the contents of those two, two filing cabinets, but within 48 hours, three Prime Ministers had taken action. Turnbull um, had ordered a distant in investigation. Um, Abbott declared that Ted's must roll and Rudd had taken legal action. So if we don't think that the bad, there's any value in that, that dark information and knowledge, well, there is. But why weren't those two filing cabinets treated the way they would have been treated if instead they had been filled with wads of $100 bills. So we need to think about it. We need to think deeply about how, this, how, we, how we manage this and govern properly. Can I respond well, to that? Yes, I'm going to ask you a question specifically, Helen. Um, so it is all about good governance. Um, so, Helen, you've raised the issue about organisations and it's corporate and uh, government agencies not understanding in some instances what a record is. One of the other challenges is the vast amount of rot, redundant, outdated, trivial data, which is actually a large cost. And to Peter's earlier point, uh, data linkages, um, you've got to be linking the right data and have good quality data. You've got uh, outdated systems, all of that uh, system integration becomes very difficult. So Helen, you know, from your perspective and you know, the vast years of experience that you have, um, there is this issue about, I think traditionally, government agencies did know where their records were and they, you know, Australia's held up, particularly in the federal government uh, sphere, back in the 70s as being a world leader. But it is a very challenging environment that we have now with paper with the cabinet papers as a great example is still occurring and and the digital um, information and and digital information transition so how as information professionals across all the different facets that we come from can we help address these issues well i think the boardrooms and the chief executives need to report it is about governance i agree james but they had, have a look at the, re, the governance chapters of the annual reports and reports to shareholders. They're thin as. They should be reporting on um, how they can assure shareholders and the public about their, um, the integrity of their data. And the people who can deliver that to the boardrooms and the chief executives are the record-keeping practitioners. The, the record-keeping professionals who operate ensuring that records are um, authoritative, that they're, they're authentic, um, they're complete, as you said, uh, Peter, they're reliable and they're inviolate, that information cannot be changed. Record-keeping practitioners and professionals should be reporting on that, should be managing that and reporting upwards to the boardroom. They don't know how to do it, but yet they do want to have better um, accountability and transparency. But if they're not reporting that in, in their formal reporting systems, then we haven't got a clue. We don't know what they're doing. So, Helen, often I see in the work that I do that uh, data governance sits within IT and records management, for example, sits within legal. Uh, and then when we talk about the importance of accountability, that sits within compliance or audit, uh, which sometimes are two separate functions. So how do we address this issue? Well, I think we all, all of those areas have the, the same um, issues. I'm not saying it all starts with the records and that's all I'm interested in. Of course, the data, um, the data, the information, the knowledge, whatever you want to call it up the, up the line, 
um, is challenged by exactly the same issues that we have been challenged by with record keeping for decades. Um, so the same aspects of being authentic, being reliable, being complete, being inviolate, it's just as relevant to data as it is to records. It's just that we've moved from paper-based records, our fossilised um, records which we can see and we believe a little more, once upon a time, um, to digital records which we assume are there. But people will say to record keepers, practitioners will say, um, not practitioners, um, the users, the actors in an organisation will say, don't worry about that little Microsoft Access database. Um, you don't need that and it's got really critical data in it so I don't let anyone have that. Um, these, these contradictions that we hear all of the time, um, it, it's as relevant to data. But I think we have to come back to first principles of uh, managing records to appreciate what's required. So what's the advice you'd give uh, information professionals in this room and watching today about how can they step up and be part of delivering on what needs to be done whether it's an agency or in a private corporation? Oh, look, I would rather bang the pots and pans on the street for the CEOs. Um, I would, they know what they have to do. Record-keeping practitioners know what's required. It's the CEOs and the boardrooms who we must pressure to um, disclose more of the evidence of their transactions. They have the people, or they should have the people, in their organisations who can deliver that up, up the line to the boardrooms. Um, they, they must use them and we should be demanding action from the top. Thank you. Now, do we have any questions? We've, we've got a few minutes left and uh, I'm happy to um, get some questions from the audience or comments. Yes? Yes? Three, three legends from South Australia up on the stage. <laughs> I'm very lucky to be here. <laughs> I can repeat the question. So this feeds off Helen's uh, point about boards and the focus. The question is, you know, with the focus on ESG, um, this uh, data and information feeds into that. Uh, I completely agree. And uh, I'm actually uh, have doing a PhD on these issues at the moment where um, I completely agree with that. So this issue about uh, that Helen's raised and is being raised now about reporting on metrics requires um, good information governance. So it is about the governance. It is led from the top mm. down. Um, James, do you have any further comments on that issue? Because I'm, I'm the facilitator. <laughs> Sorry, just got one. Look, um, there are very, there are very few good things about the whole. Um, <laughs> one of them is. You end up with lots of mates and senior decisions in the rank. So I like to ask my mates who are chief executives and, and board members, directors, I, I like to say to them, so tell me, how often do you guys ask to see the financial statements? You know, the statements of how well you're managing the financial assets of your organisation. And they say, Jane, if you're here, we ask to see them every single board meeting. Every single month we ask to see the financial statements. I say, well, oh, that's terrific. And how often do you ask to see the information statements? The statements of how well you're managing your most critical business assets. And they look at me blankly and say, what are they? How can you possibly drive business benefit if you're not managing your most critical business assets? 
Mm. And I think it's this holistic approach that's required. Uh, Peter, do you have any comments from the, the government perspective and the government strategic perspective, particularly because most of the state governments and now federally have set up the data analytics office and supporting legislation and frameworks to safeguard and protect uh, the data and information sharing? Certainly happy to give you my views rather than government's views. But um, look, I, I think one of the big challenges we've got when we use the word digital is no one really knows what it means. Um, if you do know what digital means, come and tell me afterwards. But um, it's kind of a catch -all. And just tying in some of the themes that came up before, I, I think the information and the records should be owned and created by the business units. And the other units are really the supporting areas. And part of that is understanding, well, what quality do we need? What's the cost of acquiring this information? What's the cost of correcting the information? And then to James's point, what's the value of it? Mm. Um, and what are the unanticipated uses of that data for good that, mm. that we can actually mm. apply? So I think answering those questions up front and getting those in people's minds as they're starting to go about their day jobs may help mitigate one of the big, biggest challenges I think we've got and presented at one of these conferences a few years ago, which is the records are everywhere. You know, mm. We've got OneDrive and OneNote and Microsoft mm. Word and PowerPoint and Excel and all these legacy formats like Lotus. And um, there's a big cost in translating those formats mm. into readable formats. Mm. Um, and a lot of the metadata that sits around it that actually makes it useful is not there. Mm. Um, and if you look at the disciplines, even you know, I wouldn't say I'm the best at now, um, I open up Word, it automatically saves it somewhere. Um, and I can then send off that minute, sign it, print it, whatever. Um, but the who, what, when, if not where, mm. and what all the dates are around those mm. documents. Context. And the context are not cached. Absolutely. You know, um, and even if you look at <coughs> the dates around financial transactions, I think one of the last there were 12 dates just around a financial transaction. And if you think about that in terms of records, when was it created, when was it changed, we've changed it in the sense of order things. But when was it signed, when was it sent, when was it received, when was it acknowledged, um, when was it returned. Mm. So uh, I think a lot of those disciplines are gone now because I can just open up anything I like mm. and with work from home, mm. it gets worse again. Mm. Yeah. So I think really understanding what the point of a record is in the first place, mm. um, valuing our time and creating them, putting the right quality on them are mm. all the principles we need to think about and then mm. digital is just... Uh, It'll all happen. Yeah. Mm. Well, uh, thank you. One further question. I think we're out of time, so it'll have to be very quick. <laughs> um, well, I, I think it's something that's been covered already today, which is that ultimately it should be with a single report. Um, but I think first we need to put value on it to then work out what they're going to have. Um, it, even cost, as, as an example, it used to cost a lot of money to get parchment and ink and quills and write documents. So you weren't just creating one for the sake of it. Mm -hmm. um, whereas now for something, you know, how many notes are on your iPhone? Or mm -hmm. your phone? Mm -hmm. um, so I think we really need to get back to those basic principles. What is it? What are we doing it for? What's the time in capturing these records? Um, what's the value to the organisation? Um, what's the quality of that information that we need? Um, and then obviously the standard sort of classification, integrity and availability matrix as well, and then making sure that the board understand that. Um, and James can undertake some studies in this to look at the, the wasted time in organisations. So, there's another side to that as well, which is how much money we're we spending on stuff that we don't need and use. Mm. Yeah, so um, look, the, we need to measure. We need to measure the quality of the data information and knowledge that we have, and we need to measure the benefits that, that come out of having high quality data information and knowledge. No chief executive is, is even going to look at a business case if they don't fundamentally believe there's a problem to solve. They won't invest in an initiative if the business case doesn't stand up, and they will certainly not reinvest. You will never get continuous improvement in the, in the quality of data information and knowledge if you don't have an environment of continuous, in, continuous in investment 
and continuous improvement and continuous driving of business benefit out of managing data, and data information and knowledge work. So you've got to be able, you've got to be able to, to, to measure in order to be able to manage, and and you've got to be able to, to make people want to do this stuff well. There are so many examples of beautiful bits of software being installed and not being used because there is no there is no incentive for people to do this stuff. So we, we have to be able to measure behaviours and to reward good behaviours. Thanks, James. I think Helen will have the last one word and then one. we absolutely need to wrap up. Just very quickly, Peter, um, do you think that the Office of Data Analytics, Office for Digital Government, um, should merge with the state record? <laughs> It was supposed to be a comment. <laughs> you don't have to. Oh, all I'd say is that I think they, they work really closely together. Mm. And Simon and I, when he was here, work really closely together as well. I think data and information are used separately, but mm. we use them as the same thing. You know, data in our legislation is anything that can be communicated in any form. Mm. Um, but I take your point. I, I think um, certainly we have similar... Be goals and it'll be powerful, but it's still got to come back to who's creating those records in the first place and them understanding the value and mm -hmm. boards understanding the value of that because to me that's our biggest problem. And I think you talked about rot, mm -hmm. there is so much mm -hmm. garbage data out there, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and there's so much really good data out there, and it's becoming difficult to distinguish mm -hmm. between them. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, thank you to this uh, esteemed uh, panel, Peter, James and Helen. Join with me in uh, thanking them. Susan and the panel, that was, I'm a data governance professional and I personally deal with these challenges every day and that was a really thought provoking and very inspirational talk about how much more maturity we need to have and what the roadmap is to get to where we want to be. So I was really inspired with that conversation. So thank you very much. A um, couple of things, lunch is at 12.50, but um, you're quite welcome to have a morning tea in the room where we're going to have lunch. It's available now, so if you'd like to wander out and go and get it and come back, please do so. So, it's, uh, And we're running heaps over time, so my, my job is to try, and the team is to try and recover some time, but it's like lost data, you know, once it's gone, it's gone. So, you know, whatever, let's get on with it. So, um, so we've got, coming up, we've got Tatiana Ansuvopova having a really difficult time today. Anyway, but anyway, it, we've got Tatiana here, who's the Director of Government Records and Assurance at the Data and Digital Branch in the National Archives of Australia. And uh, we're really honoured for her to have a, have a conversation with us about building trust in the public record. Where are the gaps? Could you please welcome Tatiana? Thank you. What do I do? Just yeah, you press that. I press that button. No. No. Button's not working. <laughs> okay. Ah, oh, okay. All right. Well, you all heard who I am. I'm Tatiana Ansupova, Director of Governance Records Assur Government Records Assurance Section at the National Archives. 
Uh, we used to be called different things. We used to be agency accountability, agency engagement, but the thing we're doing is the same. We're working with federal government agencies uh, and advising them how to create, manage and correctly dispose of government information. No, you have to tell us. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, what do we do? Uh, probably most of you know what national archives do, but it is good uh, to repeat certain things in an aspirational way. Um, now here that way in this professional um, professional uh, group. And what is it that we think we're doing? The National Archives of Australia is responsible for caring for the most significant records of the of Australian federal government. The archives consist of 10 millions of items and includes records about immigration, military service, transport, Indigenous Australians, science, environment and much, much more. Most of these records were received, created or kept by federal government agencies while performing their business functions. The National Archives is established under a piece of legislation, the Archives Act 1983, and is an executive agency of the Australian federal government. For the society to trust government information and data, they have to be authentic, reliable and usable. The National Archive strives to provide leadership in best practice management of the official record of the Australian government and to ensure that government information and data of enduring significance identified, secured, preserved and available to government agencies, researchers and the community. Access is provided while balancing privacy, security, confidentiality and public interest. No, <laughs> it just doesn't respond to me. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. So, uh, why we do what we do? What the National Archives preserves as National Archive resources is for the public benefit into the future, not for the sake of preserving things. Our holdings support government accountability and transparency, inform decision making, protect citizens' rights and entitlements, and contribute to Australia's shared collective cultural heritage. Without the National Archive, significant records and data would not be available. For example, records of establishment, work and findings of royal commissions, evidence of the performance of significant government policies and programs, native title determinations, immigrants' passenger arrival documentation, patents for Australian inventions and much, much more. And our legislation, the National Archives, has responsibility and power to identify the archival resources of the Commonwealth for each government function and agency, and also to authorise destruction of temporary information and data created and received by government agencies. Um, the four points um, on, the, on the slide are our four high-level selection principles of archives. Evidence of government's actions and decisions, protection of citizens' rights and entitlements, enrichment of our collective knowledge and memory, and also contribution to understanding Australia's environment. This last principle we reinstated, I think, last year, David, <laughs> didn't we? Uh, and that came from consultation, from public consultation, and our thought um, as well. We were in the middle of COVID and the place of Australia geopolitically, but also what was happening with our built and um, natural environment, what was happening with floods, fires and whatnot. We thought it was um, very important to have this principle as selection of National Archives records to have obviously, obviously in our policy statements. To support agencies, the archives issues policies, standards and guidance and advice. Our latest policy is the building trust in the public record, managing information and data for government and community. It came into effect on the 1st of January 2021 and the policy identifies key requirements for managing Australian government information assets. Policy statement you can see on the screen, agencies should manage information assets strategically with appropriate governance and reporting, implement fit for purpose information management processes, practices and systems, and reduce areas of information management inefficiency and risk. Pretty much some of the things that's already been talked about here this morning. And of course the policy is not just something new, uh, it is based on 
pretty much the same messages we were carrying over and over and all of us information professionals. The policy is based on our standard, information management standard for Australian government, which is consistent with our favourite standard 15489. Those who don't know it should leave the room immediately. <laughs> um, and uh, we, should, we should move a little bit further. Sorry, yes, one. Yeah, no, further. Sorry, I'm not even looking. Can you show me which button to press? Oh, you're doing this. So I just wanted to show the standards, the standard principles. Yeah. No, the other way. Yeah. yeah. Just to, to show, I won't read necessarily um, it to people, but again, it's the same things we've been saying and will be saying, I suspect, uh, forever. Um, next one. I would now like to talk about how the National Archives helps Australian federal government information and records managers to translate our policies and standards into daily actions. And if we're, um, as we already heard this morning, digital environments that we work in is a challenge and responsibility. Just like every other organisation, the Australian government creates and receives vast amounts of records now in data form. Digital technologies and business processes, while improving government efficiency, contribute to rapidly increasing volumes, complexity of data. Systems that capture, store and manage this data are often not so easy to understand if you don't have technical background. And we at the National Archives know that only high quality, reliable data and information can provide support for an accountable government and to empower individuals. Through our work, we're trying to help government agencies <laughs> In my notes, I've written everywhere, we're helping, we're ensuring, but now that I'm here, I feel that all we're doing are, is trying and contributing, so I wouldn't claim that we're definitely kind of doing it. Uh, we're aspiring and doing our best. So we're trying to help government agencies so that Australians can rely on government record of today as evidence of its decisions and activities. We do this by working closely with agencies and talking to them and meeting with them and discussing their problems with them. Conversations with agencies reveal that we all need to learn a lot, sometimes things flexibly about our traditional approaches when implementing our familiar information records management principles and requirements in digital environments. Sometimes when we do this, there are more questions than answers. And these are some recent questions that we have encountered in our current work with agencies, basically the conversations we are having, um, we're having now. The questions are not new, but immediacy to resolve them is here. So what constitutes records when agencies use complex digital technology systems and platforms? Not what is a record. Uh, I agree with Helen, we should know, you should know <laughs> when you're making a record. But it's just, uh, they're so complex now and the elements are um, very strange and technical. Who owns information and controls information governance processes when data is shared and integrated? And there's a lot of this happening in federal government and I'm sure in other jurisdictions as well and in private business. What is a legally acceptable record when we talk about data in complex systems? How does digital appraisal and disposal work for born digital information assets? And is digital preservation for archives only? So these are the questions we're thinking. Thank you. So th the first three questions are here. Um, sort of what constitutes the records? What happens when data is shared? What is legally uh, um, admissible? When do we get these, these questions? When agency migrate data between systems, in particular if data is going onto a new platform, platform with increased functionalities or complexity, or when they want to extract data for transfer to the National Archives. Record types that were in familiar formats and easy to handle in the analog world and our data often spread across multiple systems. One of the recent examples is um, a statutory register. Many organisations, including those in government, have to maintain those. 
statutory register means a register maintained pursuant to statutory requirement. Statutory requirement means a requirement of a written law. So it's very important to have this type of record. And there are many examples of these now maintained as databases. Entities that are required to be registered in them can do this online, including updates and submitting information as required. If it is a requirement of the law for them to be public, the register is also available online to anyone or at least parts of them. Behind the friendly, hopefully, web page facade or mobile application user interface, there are complex systems, technologies and storage arrangements. A far cry from familiar to any archivist, nice leather bound, good looking, often nice smelling ancient volumes. Even if, my, if we may have grasped how to export data from standalone databases and document them for preserving as archival records, technology moves on and complicates our work. An example from federal government. In the pursuit of continuous improvement of government services and government digital transformation and data sharing agenda, new projects and platforms are put forward, developed and implemented. For example, there's going on a modernizing business registers program for ASIC and taxation office, which aim to make it easier for businesses to meet their registration obligations, to improve the efficiency of registry service transactions, make business information more trusted and valuable. These are the aspirations of the programs. So what is happening? Um, there is a new modern service, Australian Business Registry Services being established and what happens behind the scene is multiple registers that used to be um, maintained in a variety of systems, some of the legacy systems will be moved, not all of them, some will be retired, some will be moved, <coughs> merged and there will be a wonderful online service with lots of functionalities. When records are moved, it is a good time to see what can go to the archives, in this particular case to the National Archives. And this is only one example. Um, I don't know if people read, <laughs> registered um, uh, for international travel. Earlier this year, the government released a new digital system to collect information about passengers entering Australia. The digital passenger declaration system replaced previous forms. And again, what's happening behind data that is collected goes across three government functions, immigration, health and biosecurity and agriculture. So all this data is sitting together. And back to one of my questions, who owns information and governance processes when data is kept and managed in one place, but there may be different owners to it. Uh, when we talk about extracting data from systems, agencies come to us and say, how would you like your data? You want your archival record, how would you like it? And archivists working with digital records, including data, instinctively think about the ways of preserving records for a very long time. So we think about formats that are usable, preservable, open source, preferably lossless. Uh, we also think about other things. Does the functionality need to be preserved? Are uh, the look and feel needed as well for preservation in the future? We even think of how we would provide access to these things, data sets where individual entries are connected to numerous documents. But questions remain how we describe them in our catalogues. Do we just give users the data set for them to find a database tool or conduct queries using scripts? Would ordinary users without tech background be able to do this? Or does the archives need to provide such facilities? Is it even feasible if data is accepted into our care at scale? How can data be moved when it is kept in the cloud? The best way to find out is to start doing. And as I said, we're now having conversations with a number of agencies trying to answer these questions. Our goal is to analyze various agencies and our own experiences when working on individual projects for extracting records from systems. And as the result of this analysis, we want to build and continuously update a knowledge pack as we learn new approaches through engagement with agencies. Through a variety of use cases, we can share government information managers' experiences and provide guidance to other agencies, especially smaller ones. So this is about preserving and making data available at the archives. That's what we usually do. But as we know, when you extract data from its native systems, there are losses, changes, it does not look the same. Often it is about disintegration of what seemed to be in one piece online into multiple files, pieces of code, software, metadata, text, image and AV files that document how the original system worked. <coughs> 
respect to that leather-bound volume that could be inspected and used as evidence in court easily. Would our archived and lovingly digitally preserved multiple pieces still qualify as the same type of record, for example, a statutory register? We have laws in place that support digital environments, for example, Electronic Transactions Act, Commonwealth Evidence Act is broad enough to work with digital. However, we would like more assurance that what we do as part of transfer to the archives and digital preservation will not in any way jeopardize the integrity of records and data, and they would be admissible as evidence in court. This is one of our just about to start projects, research projects, to find out what is the legal thinking on complex digital objects or data, what are the learnings from the relevant case law. So hopefully by the end of the year we will have more confidence that we're doing the right thing. And as I mentioned before, with so many integrated data services, a question arises on who owns information and controls information governance processes when data is shared. This has to be addressed at the point of design of services and platforms, even earlier. But how often does it happen in reality? Yep, we'll move to another one. A couple of other questions, and I have less <laughs> to talk about those, but lots of thoughts. Um, how does digital appraisal and disposal work for born digital information assets? Um, not just emails and documents, although they still pose questions, but also data. Our usual significance criteria to be applied to information for selection as archives um, move from individual record files level to the data set level. For example, individual case files in paper form can be called most significant selected or the largest, the thinnest, every tenth. <laughs> we all use those um, very scientific methods of selecting the most useful things. But now they're all in the data set, they're in the digital form. There's additional f value that is given to them. And we would look at selecting significant data sets rather than significant, significant cases within them. And as Jeff mentioned this morning, um, who or what are the users, potential users? Of course, we keep information for the humanity, for human beings, but there's now intermediary actors in the middle, those computers who can analyze data beyond any human's capability. So do we need to hand pick the most interesting things for them or do we give them the entire data set so they can provide some additional insights we as humans didn't even think about? The actual implementation of retention and disposal schedules in systems is also challenging and changing our traditional approach. Simply put, if you look at extracting information from a database, we're looking at selecting columns, not rows. That is, not selecting which cases we pick up out of databases, but rather from which fields from the system would be selected for the entire data set. So there's an additional step to the actual disposal process. Um, you're not only selecting the type of data, the type of the system, but also what do you take from within the systems. And you can't say everything because if people spoken or are technical experts here, they know there's a whole lot of stuff in every digital system. Do you really need to keep it all? And then again, if not all, what exactly would you pick up? And these are the questions that IT people in government agencies asking information records managers sort of, okay, so what do you want from the system? Just show me which particular column do you want um, and, and additional things. And <laughs> information managers come to us at the archives and say, well, what do we say? So it's a, it's a very interesting conversation and if you don't have a technical background, it's uh, not easy to maintain it. Um, is digital preservation for archives only? No, any organisation that needs to keep data more than five years needs to understand this process and have proper strategies and processes in place. We're interested in what agencies are doing in this space and they are doing a lot and we'll be looking at adding exemplar experiences to our knowledge pack published on our website. Just the last one. There are many challenges to traditional archival thoughts still presented by digital environment. The National Archives teams, policy, preservation, transfers and others, including my own, choose to act and learn through practical implementation. While the methods of archiving government information changed and traditional approaches are constantly challenged, 
The ultimate goal of preserving the public record that can be trusted and used in years to come remains the same. We will continue this work and value contribution from professionals across government and archival and information and data management industry like yourselves here, in the room and online. Thank you very much. Who'd like to, we've got time, a little bit of time, five minutes for questions. Tatiana would be happy to field some, field some questions if you have some. No questions from you, David. <laughs> no. Probably. Any takers? I, I've got one. Sorry. Um, um, how do we, um, with the interface between the agencies and the archives, how do you ensure that there's the custodial rights between the two, the two so that if there's changes to um, source data that the appropriate record in the archival system is reflected, is categorised and actually brought together with the base, uh, base record? How does, that, how does that change management process occur? Well, oh, the better question is how it should occur. Okay. <laughs> Let's talk about that. How it should occur. Obviously, um, in data management, sort of data provenance, data lineage yep. are very important in tracing that. And in the analog world, archives are very good at this as well. We have our traditional tools. We know how to... Um, to document when data moves from one agency to another, when fun a function moves from one agency to another, we know how to record that. Um, I think it's um, how well you can manage your metadata about your data or data about your data yeah. and, and make sure that this happens. And again, traditionally a lot of this we used to do manually, sort of humans do that. We should look at the ways how things like this could be automatically recorded as metadata and then we should have the systems that describe our records, um, our holdings, should be able to somehow populate it with the help of the computers. At the moment there's a lot of, there's a lot of manual um, activity. Um, for example, We've just had a change of government, so and we've been preparing and planning the project. Machinery of government changes how, what we need to do on our descriptive database at the National Archives to make sure that the records that are in our custody are described uh, with the right within our right agencies if functions start moving. And again, so there's three teams thinking of, of who is doing what and how they do it. And of course, uh, the team. <laughs> that we'll have to do it to actually go into database and manually type things yeah. and relink will do most of the work. For me, it was easy. I said, oh, we'll do the analysis. We'll give you the, <laughs> the data <laughs> and you then can go back. I'm not going on the database. I told my, my staff, I said, no, no, no. It's the other team that can do this. We're not doing that. So yes, again, it's just finding those more advanced ways of doing things and understanding them as well. So the question is how getting their level of maturity up to, up to a standard that you need so that you can be effective in the long as well in that kind of repository. That as well, but they all look to us sort of tell us what to do and yeah. data management we're trying to talk about our records everything's a record but now it feels that everything's almost <laughs> almost everything is now data as well and, and there are some additional quirks in managing data and some beneficial things that we need to do and we should, should be able to capture. It's about data interoperability, so we could move data easily, but nothing is <laughs> easy at this stage. You mean the actual holdings? 
I think we're getting into some petabytes, but unfortunately, most of it, well, unfortunately, well, it's, it's luckily for everybody, unfortunately for me as um, the person who works with government agencies, most of our digital collection currently is digitized collection for access, but also for preservation purposes. When we digitize, we digitize a lot of paper so that people across the country can access these um, paper, traditionally held paper records, so we digitise the lot. We also digitise at preservation standards, so we only handle each record um, once. And of course, everybody knows when you do things for preservation, your volumes go up. So there's a lot of good digitised information, but in terms of the actual born digital, the collection is a bit smaller. And that's because of all these questions that I had. These are not new questions. We had them for 10 or 15 years, well, just being charitable to ourselves, I think even earlier, and we're still trying to solve those. Uh, we've recently updated our um, digital preservation capability a couple of years ago, and the digital preservation systems is picking up um, the work. So we will be working closer with agencies. Hence, all these conversations that are happening now, we talk to three or four agencies every week about their systems, about digital. Uh, we're encourage, encouraging them to think about transfers of born digital information to the archives. Again, agencies transfer a lot of uh, digitized material as well. So there's a bit of um, disconnect there. I personally would like more born digital information to be um, to, to be taken to the archives, but of course, once you start this, it's, as, as you heard, there's lots of additional questions. So, um, yes, it, it's, it's a work in progress. Good question. <laughs> I wish I could say Google it, mate. <laughs> But um, if we move um, just slide quickly, there's my contact details in there. So if like I'll be happily, <laughs> I'll happily personally will find out next time. I'll memorise it. <laughs> just as well, <laughs> the election is over and <laughs> we don't have to remember a lot of um, statistical information on hand. But we can always find out. Thank you, Tatiana. Thank you very much, Tatiana. That was really, really insightful. Now, we've uh, got a change in the agenda. We're just swapping things around. We're just warping time and space so we can just get lunch done at a reasonable time. So um, the talk uh, from Andrew McLeanard from Callan is coming in after lunch. So right coming up right at this minute, we've got David Fricker, who's a specialist consultant in information management. He's talking on the world issues, trust and impact of industry challenges, concerns, and it's sponsored by CompuStore. Could you please welcome David Fricker? Thank you. Oh, no, there you are, sorry. <laughs> so do I have to talk into this as well or just? Uh, yep. Yep, yep, so this is full screen. Absolute professional here. <laughs> not a, not a <laughs> All right, okay, look, that's great. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, it's, it is great to be here. I should also start by acknowledging on the lands of the Ghana people and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Uh, and also my appreciation to CompuStore for uh, giving me the opportunity to be here today. 
uh, to talk about this um, issue of trust. We, um, uh, and I, I suppose I'm speaking to you also from the perspective of, uh, as many of you will know, I recently departed the position of uh, National Archives of Australia. It's great to see Simon uh, picking up the reins today. I was thinking to myself this morning, I thought, while he's out of town, maybe I could slip in behind him and take his job. And that might be a, a nice little, I wouldn't do that. Um, but it's, uh, I'm also the president of the International Council on Archives. And of course, internationally, you know, this, this issue of trust is not something which is unique to Australia. You know, this is a global phenomenon, actually, uh, of this, this breakdown in the cycle of trust. And I just wanted to talk a bit about uh, some of the international developments around that, but, but still focusing on Australia, if you like, the way Australia is sort of following the, some of those international trends. And then if I have got time, I'll, uh, I'll also speak to uh, what it means for our profession. Carefully place that microphone clear. All right, so um, I do think uh, it's very interesting that we're having this conference today, you know, after the federal election as the results of the election are sort of coming out. I think it is also a very prescient, um, well, not prescient, but I think it's a very timely reminder of the importance. I don't know about well, during that campaign, but it was, it was you know, Quite, it was a dripping with irony, I thought, that almost everybody in the major parties was sort of saying, look, you know, this is an election, you know, this is a choice, you know, this is, this is who do you trust? And then the next thing they would say is just about how untrustworthy the other party was. You know, nothing, <laughs> nothing was really coming through about what they were saying in a way of saying, you know, they were going to bring more trust and integrity, more competence even, into public administration. Uh, you know, with the exception of standing up a, 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 um, an ICAC, you know, federal uh, anti-corruption, which is, which is great, but that's, that's not like building in integrity, that's sort of having another watchdog, you know, over there. It's not saying, you know, I'm going to be better, it's saying I'm going to get a really, you know, powerful watchdog. Um, and so it was, it was quite underwhelming, you know, seeing this lack of commitment uh, to integrity and trust in the election. And then the election result, I mean, it's... it's I remember, you know, I'm also getting old. One of the things about getting old is you, you know, remember how elections used to be celebrated. It's normally a, a landslide, you know, victory would be celebrated. Now a minority government, you know, is a fantastic, you know, occasion to be celebrated. Australians don't vote, you know, are voting less for traditional institutions of democracy. They're voting for issues. You know, they're not voting for parties. They're, they're voting for issues that matter to them. And I think this is all part of our national conversation on trust at the moment. So anyway, so I think trust, trust really does matter. It's, a, it's, it's great that we, we've got this topic there. And I think trust really does matter as we've, we've heard by so many of the fantastic speakers already today, it matters a lot to us, the records and information management profession. Uh, the, other, the other thing that's, that's sort of was interesting to say, well, why, you know, why does it trust? And picking up again on the point from the panel, about you know Uber, you know we would, you know we, we worry about the elect, you know the health record. We don't trust that, but and yet we happily give our information away to Uber or Domino's or you know whoever it else it, it might be. But there's a reason for that. It's because you know Uber is not an institution. You know we we've got our national uh, institutions which we need to be trustworthy in order for the government writ large of Australia to work. Um, and, and the things that I think separate out institutions and why trust matters for institutions, which is highly relevant to us, is that we need institutions um, to make decisions about uh, our lives. You know, the, the institutions that make laws that restrict our freedoms or give us uh, more entitlements. We need institutions that we can trust to enforce those laws. You know, institutions that can deny somebody of their liberty in order to protect the community at large or to impose fines on people or to stop you when you're driving down the street. You know, we need to trust our institutions to do that, for us to give up our liberties. We need to trust institutions to judge, um, you know, our rights and entitlements. We need institutions to collect taxes, you know, trusted enough to do that. We also need them to prepare the world, you know, for our, for our children, for our grandchildren. Institutions build schools, hospitals, roads and airports. Um, you know, we need institutions that are going to care about the planet and do something about climate change. Uh, we need institutions to take risks and act in our best 
interests. You know, this is not what Uber is doing and this is not what Google is doing. You know, we need institutions uh, to invest in our future, to gamble, you know, with our, with our money, with our resources, with our immigration policy. It's always a gamble investing in our future. We need to trust someone to do that on our behalf and, of course, to develop our economy. Um, behind the veil of secrecy, we need institutions that can operate, you know, in the, you know, beyond the public domain, who can collect information about you and me and do things, you know, with very special privileged laws, again, to protect our freedom uh, and to act in our, in our best interests. Um, and finally, I would say, is, is from our point of view of documentary heritage institutions, is culture, this is a, a professional group that cares about culture, national identity. Uh, we need these institutions going to enrich our culture and allow us to enjoy our identity. And, you know, reflecting on the, the welcome to country we had from you know, this morning, you know, it's just so important for us to remember Australia's national identity is a complex fascinating, exciting, and yet so very, very challenging question in front of Australia at the moment. So how are our institutions, how can we trust our institutions to take care of that very, very sensitive and yet fundamentally important uh, debate in front of Australia? So for me, I think that trust, when we talk about trust in institutions, it's the, it's the license that we individually, the license we are giving to an entity to allow that entity to operate, to allow that entity to innovate, do something new, uh, but always to do that acting in the public good. And that's why trust you know, matters so much. And when we lose that trust, our social contract starts to crumble and fall away. And, and, uh, and Susan, I think it was in, in the panel earlier on, said that, um, made that observation that during the pandemic, there was a rise in trust the government, you know, we, we did as a nation seem to get behind the, this common enemy of COVID uh, and we placed an awful lot of trust in government and, and trust went up. And we did see, you know, government politicians sort of pushing public institutions in front of them. So no, no, we're acting on health advice. We're acting on, on, you know, the best sort of scientific advice. Not so much on climate change, but certainly on health. We're following the science, you know, we're going to do this. Um, but it's really interesting what's happened just since, you know, since we started to come off the, the intense effects of COVID. And nobody talked about COVID in the election campaign. You know, there's a general feeling now that Australia's over it, we want to do it, even though the statistics are quite alarming in terms of how many people are struck down. Um, and what, what I'd refer to here is that um, there was an Edelman, I think people would be familiar with the Edelman Trust Barometer. Edelman is a... Uh, it's an American, it's an international uh, company, but um, consultancy. But for the last 22 years, Edelman has been uh, doing an annual global survey on trust, on you know, how much trust uh, the public has in their, in their institutions. And they, they, I've got the numbers down here in front of me, just in case someone asks a difficult question. Tatiana, listen. Paper is good. Um, in it, so this is 22 years they've been running it. They, they survey about 36,000 respondents in 28 countries, and including you know between one and 2,000 respondents in Australia. Um, and what was interesting was that uh, last year, so the, the the result prior to the one just published, trust went up. You know everyone's saying, oh hooray, you know people are trusting government more. But what they found in this one, uh, the, the survey conducted in November 2021, trust had plummeted way down. And most interestingly, it's gone down in democracies. So autocracies, trust in government is going up. In democracies, it's coming down. And you can theorise about that. And I, I think it's because people in, to in autocracies don't particularly like the way that the government's acting, but they trust them. You know, they think they're telling the truth about what they're doing to them because they're not a democracy. And so they can just basically do whatever they want. Um, but, I, but it's fascinating to see that trust has plummeted um, in, in, uh, in Australia, and that reflects what's happening in democracies around the world. And in fact, the headline was, uh, in the Australian report that Edelman produced, the headline was, Australia's trust bubble has burst. Um, and so, and I, I'm conscious of time, so I'll, I'll move along here. But just some really interesting uh, uh, results out of that survey. That only, this is in the most recent survey, only 52% of Australians 
say they trust government to do the right thing. And that's a nine point drop in the preceding year. Um, they also uh, believe that journalists uh, and government leaders and business leaders, but, but more so journalists and government leaders are actively trying to mislead them by saying things they are know are false or grossly exaggerated. So we all, and you know, we're all nodding in the room now, we all know that, you know, whatever it takes, I'm going to put, you know, spin, it's become more and more spin, and now it's become, I can dress this up in this way, or I can sort of, you know, conveniently turn a blind eye to that part of the truth and just, you know, talk about this. Um, it is 61%, uh, so a majority of Australians, 61% of Australians, they, it has gotten to a point where Australians are incapable of having constructive and civil debates about issues they disagree on. And, you know, that rings true. I mean, you know, we're talking about divisiveness in Australia, we're talking about the fragmentation of the Australian electorate, talking about the rise of identity politics, uh, you know, poor information literacy across Australian society. Um, there's almost a disdain for evidence. You know, people will really want to just pick and choose uh, what suits them, you know, sort of in the echo chambers of social media. Uh, has created for us. And, and one other thing more, there is more trust in business. So people, and we've seen this in Australia, clearly we've seen CEOs in the business sector standing up and talking about issues of, of equality, talking of issues of L LGBTQI issues, talking about climate. You know, we're, we're seeing a lot more leadership on social issues from the corporate sector than we are from the government. And, and that's reflected in these survey results. Australians are trusting business leaders more uh, than they are government, you know, their, their elected representatives. So, you know, really, really um, interesting and I think important, uh, important lessons for us out of that. Um, so government and the media in Australia are seen as divisive social forces. Uh, so more than half of Australians think that government is divisive and this is uh, especially so in democracies, because government, you know, in a three-year electoral so in federal, you know, cycle, three years is a very short time. You never stop campaigning. So everything you say, you're thinking about the vote, you know, at the next election. So this divisiveness is encouraged uh, because that will win votes. Uh, and then the media will pick up on that division, that divisiveness, because that, you know, that that gives them clicks. You know, there are more clicks when you get a, a very divisive, you know, a scandal sort of story. Uh, and so traditional media, again, just a few more statistics, trusted by 48% of Australians, less than half, trust traditional media. Search engines are only trusted by 47%, less than half. Uh, owned media, so that, you know, the mastheads, 33% level of trust in the, in the traditional, you know, mastered media. And social media, happily, I'm pleased to say, only, only one quarter of us actually trust social media. <laughs> and, and yet, this is the, by far the majority of information consumed is social media. So that is a worry. So, um, and, and as I say, it's interesting that business and NGOs as well are seeing as more trustworthy institutions. It comes back to my earlier thesis that Australians are becoming more issue focused and less rusted on to any traditional you know, institution of democracy. We follow who's got these, and this I think is the rise of the teal seat, you know, the, the politicians, etc. Issue politicians. Anyway, and what Edelman, before I do just conclude somehow, Edelman uh, in the, no one's hungry, are you? Yeah, nobody wants much. You'd much rather listen to me, right? Um, the, and anyway, they said there are four, they sort of proposed there are four ways, and only four, right? These are the four most important ways to, to restore the cycle. And this is where it has a special meaning for us. Um, they're saying that business's societal role is here to stay, that, you know, business should maintain, hold that leadership. So, you know, we've seen people like Alan Joyce, Twiggy Forrest, you know, these, these people are business leaders being quite outspoken. They reckon that's a healthy thing that should continue. Uh, they also say that we should all be demonstrating tangible progress. The points earlier about what boardrooms should be doing, about what should be measured as corporate success Australia, they're saying that, you know, you have to bring that to the fore and demonstrate you are making progress on those fronts. Focus on long-term thinking and, you know, solutions versus short-term divisiveness. But my point here is the fourth thing was that the thing, and this in the, in the survey results, this is the most significant thing 
in all of the respondents' minds around the world, the most significant thing to break the cycle of distrust is to provide credible information. You know, this is the one thing. As Adrian Cunningham, um, Helen, you know, quoted Adrian, the currency of democracy, you know, are the records. So credible information, we, we understand that to mean record, right? It's not just the dross of, you know, what's floating around. It's something which has actually been carefully captured and kept in its in integrity. And so this is, this is the thing that, you know, what we have to do as a, as a profession is to recognise this. Now, I've quoted the Edelman Trust Barometer. That's one survey. I think it's a reputable survey, but it's one, you know, there's many other sources of uh, data on this. But what we have to do is to think about our role, I think, as, an in, as a profession, uh, to say, all right, well, what can we do to provide that credible information, to break that cycle of distrust? Um, and I think there are quite a few, and just in three or four minutes, because a lot of this has been said, I think there are quite a few takeaways, or just a few takeaways for us in our profession. And Helen, I think you nailed it as well. You know, it's about me, I think you're banging the pots and pans for the CEO level. And I think a lot of it is to build that relevance to what is being discussed in the boardroom, you know, and not, not necessarily talk about, you know, what format of you know, record we should be having or you know, whatever, but really why does this matter to corporate Australia? Why does this matter to government? Um, and so one is that we've seen you know, integrity and competence you know, are two things that the public is looking for. So we have to need time what we are doing to integrity and competence at the boardroom level. Because nobody will survive in this world if they cannot demonstrate that. It doesn't matter whether you're selling chickens or whether you're, you know, selling cars or whether you're delivering health services, integrity and competence. And so our records and information policies uh, need to make sure that, you know, we've got to sell up that we are collecting records that provide evidence of integrity and competence. So records are evidence upon which uh, decisions, actions can be made, taken with integrity. Um, they are in, in inputs into decision making. Also, we have to maintain records that support the scrutiny of decisions. So beyond, you know, oh, we just had a transaction, we just, we just sold the chicken over the counter or we've just given someone their um, health entitlement. Okay, now that transaction not only has to be recorded, of course, but it also has to support the scrutiny upon, you know, that will come upon that transaction. And it also has to, we have to keep enough records to demonstrate that was a evidence-based decision of, of high integrity. Um, the right records need to be made in the first place. Again, the currency of democracy. It's not enough. You know, we have to keep saying that records are not made as an accidental byproduct of activity. Records are being made um, in order to reflect uh, the, the integrity and competence of the, of the way in which this uh, business is operating. Um, I think also we do, in the public domain, in the government domain, I should say, we do have more clarity around what is a public record as a private record, you know, what sort of records should be made, should be kept, preserved by public institutions. We need to make clear the boundary of official and non-official, where we're outsourcing services to private uh, contractors, to private suppliers. Scrutiny has to go all the way through there because they are operating in the public coin. They are also making uh, decisions that affect our lives and our freedoms. I think also we, we, we should be looking across technology as well, getting back into our profession, that things like blockchain, I think, is a, is a reaction against, you know, trust in public institutions. Blockchain is a, a way of democratising trust. And I think as a profession, we, we should be making sure we're watching blockchain and all the associated implementations of that. And if we can adopt it, I think it would be a good thing because that also generates more public trust. But it's, it's we're going beyond the human frailties of, you know, whoever is doing the work, but this idea of a distributed ledger is... Um, uh, helps. Um, look, uh, the, the, in terms of accountability, you know, we, we're selling up that records are here to maintain accountability, uh, proper mechanisms in place for what should be made public, what should be kept private, uh, what is confidential and what should be kept secret. And we need strong cases, easy ways to explain why that record is a secret. You know, the, the thing, uh, in, again, in the, in the institution, you know, it's not enough. If people want to see all of the data for the modelling that we're talking about in the pandemic, um, you know, if, if that data is not revealed because the general public doesn't have the expertise to, to make the judgment that the institution has made, 
Um, there's two problems with that. One is that we then become overly secretive and it looks like we're just holding that stuff back from the public. But it belies the other problem is that the whole thing started because the public don't think the institution has got the expertise it should have. You can't trust that institution. Like you know, a lot of the, the, on the climate uh, debate, you know, the Bureau of Meteorology gets attacked from time to time as not as trying to hide the truth, which is a shame. You know, Australia should trust the Bureau of Meteorology as our national institution. Um, so look, and I think um, you know, building up, uh, and I'll, I will jump to the end here because I know we're getting well into lunchtime. Um, I also think the, the earlier discussion as well is quite important. If we are going to develop this trust in public institutions, if we are going to make sure that credible information is being made available and is provided, we really do have to dial up uh, the way that we do digitise records. There are still far too many records uh, being kept in analogue form and far too many records, even in digital form, but being kept in very narrow, silo, compartmented environments. So I think the digitisation agenda should really be dialed up. I know it's expensive. I know it's, it's time consuming. It's uh, still quite labour intensive, actually. But I think in the boardrooms and in the executive boards around Australia, I think we have to argue the business case we're digitising more of those records so that we can derive true meaning from the data that is held in those records, but also that that can then form a base for providing credible information you know, through, the, through the institutions, through the general public. A bit was said about the ESG agenda as well in this morning's session. This is the other thing I did want to touch on is that it's now becoming much more important for every organisation, government, non, you know, uh, corporate or, or uh, not-for-profit, uh, not only to demonstrate how profitable it is or how it's doing a great job of de developing the outcomes, but this environment, social and governance agenda. Every entity is going to be judged more and more on how well, how responsible it is in its behaviour towards the environment, how responsible it is towards societal issues and its governance, how well and ethically it is governed. So within the organisation. Are we, you know, um, demonstrating equality? Are we, are we doing what we should be doing in terms of gender equity, removing uh, institutional racism? You know, these sorts of things. Um, and I think also, in our in our profession, we should all be looking at our organisations that we work within. Look at our enterprise risk register, for, the, for example. Look at the stuff that is going to the board. It's like, okay, where on the risk register are these ESG issues being dealt with? on our corporate risk register, well, here's, here's what I'm doing in our records and information management, and that's a mitigation against that risk. It's a, it's a rising, you know, it's a growing uh, issue for directors uh, in Australia and around the world, and, and we should really be leaning right in there and saying, well, yes, you know, this, the records, believe it or not, the records management policies of this organisation are uh, tier one issues for the governance of this organisation. Um, and so, yeah, and keep records. You know, we, we also need to keep records that demonstrate the social responsibility of an organisation, that demonstrate the way the workforce is being managed, demonstrates the way we're treating the public with respect, and demonstrates the extent to which we're exercising social responsibility and envi environmental care. So I think, you know, there are some big messages in there, as I do conclude. Coming out of that Edelman uh, Trust Barometer, I think there are big issues for democracies around the world. You know, and I think we, we've seen early last year, you know, the, the democracy in America, how fragile that is at the moment. I think we've seen in this election, just this last weekend, how different Australian democracy is becoming. Uh, and I think that we, we really do need to recognise that we have a fundamental role, fundamental role in building trust in public information, building trust in the information that we create and our role in assuring that Australia has got a resilient democracy uh, going forward. So I'll leave my remarks there and thank you once again for letting me through. Thank you. You offer some solutions to our thinking about the 
Yeah, look, absolutely I do. And I, and I think it's also very important uh, not only to um, maintain that, you know, that professional development, of course, the rental function, you know, what would I say that we need, you know? Uh, and, and this is the difference between technical expertise and professionalism, because a professional, and this is why these events are great, because as professionals, we do think more broadly about what the impact is on the world of what we're doing. And that's, that's the difference between a professional association and sort of you know, technical competence. Um, so I do think it is important for us to do that, and I think it's important for us to be talking about those broader uh, you know, political issues, social issues, etc., and how we, how we function within, I keep using that term, resilient democracy, because I do personally worry about this, and you know, I think we need it. Um, how we how we play within you know responding to the, the divisions that exist across Australia and to try and unite us all towards a more ambition you know in our future. Um, the other thing though I, I just always encourage uh, people to do is quite apart from from learning more about information management, records management, all the rest of it, is to just read you know whatever organisation you work in, just read the annual report. You know, find out who's on the board. You know what. Um, you know, what, what's the CEO worried about at the moment? What, what is the board on the CEO's back about? You know, where, where do they see the risks are and the opportunities ahead for the organisation? If you're in government, you know, again, read the annual report, but if you're in government, just look at the last time the executive went before a Senate estimates committee or a parliamentary inquiry. What were they getting, you know, pressured about? You know, what, read the paper, you know, what, what's, What's the general public upset about at the moment? What are they happy about? And I think the more we can, you know, connect at that level and just imagine how we can solve that problem or we can we can recognise an opportunity here and get involved in that. I, I think that's really helpful. And I think these sort of professional gatherings are, are really important to do that because we do play a big part. As that survey showed, you know, that in that top four, credible information is what people are desperately needing at the moment. And as information professionals, you know, we know that it's just not a simple transaction. It's not, you know, providing credible information doesn't mean that you open the, you know, open your repository and say, everyone come in and help you fill. There's a lot involved here. Uh, and that's what we've got to do. We are the brokers. We've got to be the honest brokers between the, you know, the sausage making of information and providing credible information uh, to the public. But, you know, as a whether you're in business or government, you know, you've got to exercise careful judgments. There are people's privacy at stake, there's confidentiality at stake, there's national security at stake. So there's, that's us, you know, that's where we operate in there. Um, so, so I do think more professional training, but I'd really encourage all of us just to keep reading up, you know, find out what matters to the people running the world, and that way we can position ourselves in, in, at their table on their issues and mitigate their risks and give them the strategies that they need. And, um, and while we're getting the next question, um, again, thinking about the welcome to country here, you know, I do think that uh, on reconciliation as well, you know, we've got a huge role to play there. And again, I refer to the, the ICA and uh, ASA and Rupin that the um, that certainly the ICA Tandania uh, statement, I think, and now that this new government is um, you know, uh, clearly stated commitment to the statement of the heart. I think this is going to become very, very important for us soon. And records, as we as we heard this morning from Katrina, records, the collective memory of Australia is very important here, and there's a lot of painful truth telling coming our way. We, we've really got to be involved in that. Thanks. Thank that was a long answer to a very brief question. I'm sorry. Um, we really should go, but I'll take. I did promise two, so. One minute, two minutes tops. Okay. Ten, ten second answers, I yeah, promise. Yeah. <laughs> um, Michelle, yeah. 
the Jews. Is Uh, yes, very, very briefly. Around consent, you know, because I think, I think partly because, you know, we have a three year federal election cycle, so campaigning never stops. Um, maybe, you know, I think there's a lot of backslapping at the moment around Australia that, you know, we've learnt all these lessons from the election and, you know, I, I don't believe it. You know, I, I think politics in Australia has, has got a bit grubby lately and I think people, um, you know, I think there still seems to be this formula on how to run politics and how to win votes in Australia. And so I do worry that it's, it's going to take a while before it gets better in Australia, is my honest um, thing. And, and, I, and I think, uh, and, you know, internationally, the other answer to your first question, I think the fact that this is an international trend in democracies, and I keep saying this, this isn't only affecting democracies, it's, uh, we've got to watch that. And, and I think the fact that it's an international trend probably means it is going to continue to be an issue. Um, the more we talk about it, the more resilient we can become as, as Australian, the electorate, I think it might be better. Maybe with a bigger crossbench in Parliament, uh, that may be something that sort of balances out that sort of de divisiveness, etc. But, um, but I, I suspect that um, it's going to continue to be an issue for Australian democracy for some, some time to come. Um, and look, talking about all, I'd, all I'd say is to reiterate, in the interest of brevity, all I'd say is uh, just reiterate, I think we always should look to ourselves about what we can do. And I think within this profession of ours, I think there is a constructive uh, contribution we can make. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
outside in here. I can't. Can... Sorry? Just start. Um, hi, everyone. I hope you had a great lunch. I, I should, you know, I should acknowledge the fact that these events take so much time, a lot of resources, a lot of time, volunteer, paid, sponsored. It's just these are big events to, and you know what, we're not, we're not match fit yet in terms of attending regular events in person like we used to. So this is a big deal to just to pull off an event like this. So I just thought I'd acknowledge that it's been a collaboration of Asa, Alia, Rimpa, of course, as the host, Dharma, um, Hima, National Archives of Australia and New Zealand Archives. And I've got to acknowledge the sponsors um, because, you know, without them, we wouldn't be here. Um, the platinum sponsor is uh, Active Nav, who's doing the live streaming. Gold sponsor is National Archives, and they sponsored the, uh, the discussion panel. I've got all the papers here now, by the way. Um, silver sponsor is CompuStore, who did David's, uh, who sponsored David Fricker's excellent speech, and uh, really, really worthwhile. Um, TIMG were, were the lunch sponsors. Um, bronze sponsors are Fujifilm, Record Solution, Solutions, and FYB. So, next up, we're swapping the order around a little bit, as we do. So, we've got um, Andrew McAlinden, McAlinden, who's the CDO of Callan, and um, he's really proudly on the member, he's one of the members of the Dharma South Australia Committee. Uh, he's the CDO for Callan. Dr. Mark Mackay, who's the Director of Complete the Picture Consulting, also on the committee with, with me. And uh, unfortunately, Tanya Reid has um, got an injury over the weekend, so she can't be here, unfortunately. And the topic for the discussion is use and misuse of information and making sense of data and that context always context always matters. So if I can pass over to Andrew and Mark and they'll kick it off. Thank you very much. All right, thanks for that introduction. Can you hear me okay? Great, okay, thanks. We'll get started. So, thanks, Andrew. Um, I'm Andrew McAlinden, Chief Data and Analytics Officer at Central Adelaide Local Health Network. Um, apologies, Tanya couldn't be here. She was one of the Bernadette, one of the joint Bernadette Bean Award winners for medical records improvement last year, but. Um, um, she's contributed today, so we'll push on and see where we go. So Central Adelaide Local Health Network, if you haven't heard of it, it's basically the RA, Queen Elizabeth Hospital. Not working? No. Oh. Sorry? Okay. Uh, the RA, Queen Elizabeth Hospital, uh, Hampstead, and a whole range of statewide services, including SA Pathology, who, who led the um, gauntlet in terms of COVID testing during the pandemic, obviously. Um, so it's a large organisation, it's about 16,000 staff, and um, yeah, there's a lot of activity that goes through. Um, this is a really interesting slide, and, and I've put this up because we're often asked, we're a very reactive organisation, we just need data, can you just spin us up a report? Just give us the best you've got. We don't care if it's not up to scratch, we just need something and we need it today. And so I think this was a really good slide for indicating some of the dilemmas we went through, and particularly so with um, COVID vaccination reporting, whereby um, although the analytics tools were good, and I think Peter Worthington Air spoke about analytics earlier on, sometimes the data is not up to scratch, and particularly um, HR data is one of the least reliable sources of information we've got. So, <laughs> apart from who we pay, we know who we pay, because we always get that part, well, we usually get that part right. Okay, so a really um, a good Dilbert um, cartoon. Always question data provenance. What's data provenance? And I'm not gonna read all of this out, but Data provenance tells us about where the data came from and the processes and methodology by which it was produced. 
So you might be thinking that piece of data that you're reporting comes from a drop-down box in a screen. But what if it doesn't? What if it comes from a document in a clinical electronic medical record system whereby it might be a resuscitation document and there's five or six different resus options. Which one's been chosen? How accurately or completely is that filled out? And you as the data user at the end of the day get given a file on a USB and you think, yep, yeah, resus field's there. I can use that and I can draw conclusions and interpretations. But without understanding the data provenance, you really have no idea as to whether that field is fit for purpose or not. And we often use an analogy in some of the data governance leaders conferences of two glasses of water. One, one glass of water has bugs in it and the other doesn't and both look clean. You don't know unless you actually test it or unless someone gives you the information to say this is the contaminated glass, then you really don't know. So asking questions about where the data's come from, when it was produced, who produced it, and as which workflow produced it is so important. Um, Sunrise, EMR and PAS. Most of you know we have this electronic medical records system in South Australia. It used to be called EPAS and a few years ago went back to its original name as Sunrise. So it's been rolled out to several metropolitan hospitals. We're currently rolling out to women's and children's and to Lyle McEwen Health Service as well, with Modbury to follow a bit further down the track. But there's millions and millions of documents in this system, and this slide's a little bit old now, it's June 2021, but that number's probably doubled since last year. So it's absolutely huge. So keeping a handle on the quality of the information in a system like that is very, very challenging. And um, so, so the, the medical records team at um, RA and QEH have had to put in all kinds of processes and systems, and, and we don't always get it right. But at least we um, uh, have, a, have a great team in place and good workflow processes. Can I ask you a question? Sure. So we're going to tag a bit on our standard questions at a certain time, so on the mark. Uh, a lot of records, Andrew. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go down to ED afterwards to get something checked. Mm -hmm. How many records would I generate in your system? Well, you're going to generate one electronic medical record. However, you may have about seven documents created as part of that. The difference now that we've gone fully electronic is those documents will end up getting scanned and re-uploaded back into the EMR. So having a timely scanning process is a very important part of the picture as well. Okay. Should you be unlucky enough to go back to ED the following week. Okay, so <laughs> how quickly does it get scanned? Um, that has varied along our maturity cycle, but we've just implemented a centralised scanning um, system last year. It was decentralised previously. When it's not going well, in a, a non-decentralised system, it can easily be two weeks or longer, but we, we've got that down to about two days now turnaround. So. But ideally, um, even though we're, we've got an electronic medical record system, uh, it's a hybrid system still. We're still scanning paper, we're still scanning things that doctors send in. Really, the Nirvana is having everything electronic, and then it will be no scanning. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. I'll let you get back to your presentation in a sec. As a if I was a clinician, mm -hmm. I still couldn't rely on that for ensuring everything was there quickly. The key information is going to be in your emergency department attendance record in that case, so your key information is going to be there. But in terms of consent forms, which you may have signed, those kind of things, there may be a bit of a lag for those getting scanned in. Thank you. Cool. Thanks. All right. Um, so, so I think we set the scene for the fact that um, data is actually a byproduct of patient care. We don't have all these doctors and nurses going around inputting data so we can analyse it. They're actually providing care to these patients. And importantly, um, a lot of the information is not captured in structured fields, in drop-down boxes. It's actually captured in what's called a workflow. And to simplify enormously, a workflow is a process that a clinician follows to treat a patient. So for instance, it may say, patient comes in, do this, then set up their record in the EMR, then you need to do an order for a 
If they need to see an allied health person, we'll send off an allied health order, so on and so forth. And so depending upon how the clinician follows that workflow, the data may end up in different places or in different orders, or it could be missing altogether. So you really need a subject matter expert who knows how the data is entered. And we've had to do this recently with the patient flow module with the EMR. We've had to send one of our data integration specialists down to the emergency department, see how they're actually using the patient flow application and actually record the steps and record where the data is getting entered. So, so they're certainly not simplistic databases, EMRs. So, so at the end of the day, EMRs are set up to retrieve records quickly when um, the clinician needs to treat the patient in front of them. They're not set up for analysis. And in fact, if we started running a lot of advanced analyses, then the EMR would slow down to um, the snail's pace. In fact, a lot of the time, the EMR team will just blame it on done reporting. We're going to switch off all the analyses and reports because that will restore the timeliness of the EMR. So um, what you really need is a data warehouses and clinical data repositories to solve that problem. And we started setting up some of those systems in South Australia. But there are many, many uses of patient data that are legitimate, um, that fall under this category called secondary use. So case review and quality assurance, reviewing what happened to a patient. Perhaps they had a, a bad outcome or perhaps they even died. Um, refining the evidence base for making decisions. So medicine is very slow to review the evidence base and we, we need to make sure that's kept up to date. Personalised medicine. So there's some people who don't respond well to certain drugs, yet we give it to them anyway. But if we had a genomic sequence, we would know that people with certain genomic phenotypes don't respond well to that kind of drug and we should actually use a different kind of drug. And then the one that I tend to get involved in more is performance monitoring and activity-based funding. So ultimately, the way in which we record our data impacts the way in which our health system is funded. Not going to spend too much time on this, but you'll notice the key thing is the medical record is actually at the top, very top of the chain. And uh, we used to blame clinical coding a lot, and certainly there was a lot of improvement to making clinical coding, but a lot of the time now, it comes back to how well is the information being entered into the clinical record by the clinicians. And so we've, we've done a lot of work around what's called clinical documentation improvement to improve the quality of the clinical record, which then makes it easier for these people called clinical coders to do their jobs. And what the clinical coders do is they translate what the doctors and nurses write into about 10,000, there's about 10,000 total ICD-10 AM codes. Those ICD-10 AM codes are then grouped according to um, a, a classification system called diagnosis related groups. But essentially, they're based on different parts of the body system, but they're meant to reflect a similar resource use for each of the 770 plus diagnosis related groups. The national funder, IPA, then calculates weights for each of those DRGs. So uh, uh, a renal dialysis patient, for instance, might have a weight of 0.25, for example. A heart transplant might have a weight of 50. And basically that weight gets multiplied by a thing called the national price. Now, if that's confusing, you don't need to remember any of that, but it's if we don't record things properly up the top and we progressively um, make mistakes down the chain, our funding gets affected and, and we can lose out a significant amount of funding. For those of you from South Australia, you might remember this headline from about three years ago. If data sleuths find $54 million in SA hospitals, lazy record keeping. Now, it was actually a good news story, but if you <laughs> read, it, read it on the surface, it actually sounds a bit critical. But essentially what happened there was we found out that there were, um, and it was not so much the clinical coding, but the administrative coding, there were consistent mistakes being made. And um, those mistakes essentially resulted in us losing that activity-based funding. 
So we created what was called a data integrity unit, team of five people, whose job it was to go through and correct the critical errors. And um, we actually avoided losing that money. So that was a real success story for us. Yep. Sure. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> if you didn't have uh, funding attached to that, those records, would you have fixed them up? <laughs> we, we are so short on money in the health system, we, we will do whatever makes the most financial sense. So there would have been some effort to fix them up, but not the same level of effort, which is why we need systems in place to prevent errors. It's much better to actually have processes that prevent those errors from happening in the first place. That's a critical mm -hmm. issue for health. Uh, it really is. I know we've only got a few minutes left. Then. Sorry, we have got four quick scenarios, Andrew. Yeah. Um, so, some different examples of those, and this is where Tanya was going to talk a little bit more about what was happening at the coalface, but um, we'll run through these quickly. So, incorrect patient demographics is a pretty obvious one. Um, that can cause a whole range of issues. The, the one I've pointed out there is that we actually get more funding for Indigenous patients, about 30% higher, and also for rural and remote patients, so that means we need to record the Indigenous status and we also need to record the postcode accurately. Now, there are all kinds of issues with that, including that Indigenous patients have the right not to declare they're Indigenous if they may feel that their healthcare is potentially going to be compromised by declaring that. Hopefully they don't feel that way, but sometimes they do. Now, we may actually see from the previous record that they are indeed Indigenous, but we're not actually allowed to change the record to, to reflect that and therefore we miss out on the funding. So there are all these nuances in terms of how we record information. And obviously if we, if we get the spelling of the name wrong or we get that reversed or something like that, we could potentially join up the wrong patient's records. And again, we have a team, the Data Integrity Unit, that spends a lot of time going and reviewing those cases and running checks. It's pretty important. Okay. Sense of care hours, this is a pretty simple one. Um, every hour of patients in ICU, there's $249 an hour funding to pay for the intensive nursing care and other high tech costs. However, there have been system issues in relation to the way in which ICU hours are being automatically calculated where there have been inaccuracies with that. And so what we've been doing is working hard to change some of the, sorry, I thought I'd turn that off, to, to actually um, address some of the system issues which have resulted in those being inaccurate. Again, you don't need to have that out by very much to lose significant funding for a place like the Royal Adelaide Hospital. So um, uh, episode of care, this is a bit of a complex one and I have to explain what an episode is. So an episode, is when you get admitted to hospital and then you get either discharged from hospital or you get transferred somewhere else, such as to a rehab service. So that's what we call an episode. Now, if clinicians um, or administrative staff don't actually record when that episode change should occur, again, we'll lose funding. We, we get penalised for a long length of stay. So if we keep someone in as an acute patient when in fact they should have been discharged to a rehab service or to palliative care or to maintenance care, which is basically a nursing home type, then um, we, we get a fi for, for most DRGs, essentially we get a fixed amount of funding simplified. So if someone stays twice as long, you don't get twice as much. It means we're getting half the payment for each day. So if we don't have the systems and processes in place, then A, we're gonna lose funding but B, there's an impact on their national data collection. So some of this data goes nationally up to the palliative care outcomes um, uh, facility, the Australian rehabilitation outcomes, and it impacts our benchmarking. So when we compare our hospitals to other states and they say, RAR's twice as expensive or people stay twice as long as there are. But if it's just, you're not actually changing the episode of care, then some of that difference isn't actually real and therefore the benchmarking is a lot more limited. 
Um, anything from you, Mike? No, no, I think that's fine. I'm just conscious of time. Sure. I'll just finish up on the last one, being conscious of time. I've kind of blended a couple of things here. So a lot of you would be familiar with the um, main attributes of data quality, and some of you may be able to remember some of them, but not all of them. So accuracy, timeliness, accessibility, et cetera, et cetera. But getting back to data provenance, what I've tried to impose on there is... Um, uh, well, we actually need to know more than just that. We need to know where's the information come from? In what context should I use it? Is it the right measure? Just because someone's given you a field that says average length of stay, well, which average length of stay is it? Is it overnight? Is it excluding mental health? Is it um, another sort of average length of stay? And if the author hasn't actually put the source or the time they extracted it, then you as the reader have no idea. And this is a real issue that we face at our executive level every day where someone's given the figure, doesn't agree with what I had previously, but there's no supporting information or context. So I encourage you to ask yourself, um, where does it come from? Who produced it? What produced it, i.e. workflow? Have there been any unusual circumstances? Like, did they close those beds? Did they suddenly take general medical beds and reallocate them to COVID patients, and you didn't know about that when you're doing your analysis. How trustworthy is it? Is it fit for purpose? So sending something out for a marketing purpose might be quite okay if your email address is 90% accurate, but it's probably not okay for billing purposes. And um, is it the right measure? And finally, is there a risk that data integrity has been affected by recent changes to underlying business processes or clinical workflows. And that's a really important one for us in the health setting. So if someone's changed that resus orders document, they've added an extra field and your data integration logic doesn't know about that change, you can suddenly be spitting out garbage. So you've got to put your rules into a middle layer where it's easier to maintain them and update them. Anyway, we're completely out of time, sorry. Just to give you a little bit of context, I do modelling with colleagues and we use the health data and we had a large modelling project uh, for SA Health. We spent probably nine to ten months cleaning the data so we could actually do the work. So it really is important getting this stuff right. Mm -hmm. I know we're out of time, so thanks. Can you give one question? <laughs> Questions? <laughs> I didn't notice any. Changing the time, so yeah. it's the change of the How do you yeah. manage that? that? That's a really good question. Generally, the um, generally clinicians are too busy treating patients to care about much of that kind of stuff, and and we're we're still rolling out our ABF education program. So so there'll be some clinicians that know and care, but most aren't going to go to that level of bother. Um, it, it's more an issue at a higher level in terms of, um, say for instance, I'll give a really good example, maintenance care. So someone's ready to be a nursing home type patient, even if they've got to remain in an acute hospital bed. Now, when you become a maintenance care patient, there is usually a small surcharge. I can't remember what it is, might be 20 or 30 bucks a day. So a lot of clinicians will actively resist changing the episode of care to maintenance type because they know there might be a cost for the patient and eventually the patient might be able to get out of paying it, but um, that remains a disincentive for those clinicians, but it results in our length of stay blowing out and us basically losing a lot more funding. Cool. I think there's one at the back as well, is there? I'm sorry? 
they are now on it. They, they, they had the fun of having a hybrid system for a while where they had a, the repat and paper records at Flinders and then they brought the repat patients in. So the repat patients at Flinders were using it and the rest of the patients were on paper. So it's very challenging from a clinical governance perspective. It's immediate, and that, that is one disadvantage of the new, new system, is you've got to be entered on the system before you can be triaged, whereas in the old system it's like, you look like you're about to keel over, go straight in, now we've got to enter your details. So they've invented this thing called a quick registration. So we just take the bare basic details so our nurses can triage you, but the key then is we need to follow up all of those cases and ensure they get the rest of the information. So that's the challenge that comes out of that. So there are disadvantages of electronic as well, and that's one of them. Thank you, Andrew. Andrew, I'm sure we could do another half an hour easy on the topic. I mean, it affects everyone in this room, right? So it's such an important topic. So uh, next up. Let's get my car. Let's see what I can do. Who's on next, Andrew? Mm -hmm. So, uh, next up, um, we've got um, a session here by Kylie Percival, who's an associate by University Librarian at the uh, Academic Education University of Adelaide, um, and it's very, very, um, very interesting, interesting, it's very interesting title, you can trust me, I'm an information, information professional, sponsored by Australian Army and Information Association, RBA, so please don't give it up for the party, thank you. Hello, everybody. So I think we've we this, the tech is getting more and more streamlined as the day go progresses. So you know it's an advantage being after lunch. What can I say? I'm happy to take it. Um, okay, so so we're shifting the the conversation a bit with my session to really look at ourselves. Okay, so we're 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 shifting the the uh, the spotlight. We've talked about our oh, organisations um, and now processes more recently in the session that preceded. Um, but I want to talk about us, okay? The people in the profession. And uh, in the university environment, we have to teach students um, about how they can trust sources, what sources are trustworthy. And we have something that is occasionally used called a CRAP test, okay? Now the CRAP test, um, it's C-R-A-A-P, it's uh, Currency, Relevance, Authority, accuracy and purpose. So, you know, this, this is encouraging you, you know, not to rely on social media for your source of truth, but to actually look at peer-reviewed quality information. And it occurred to me that perhaps we should be applying this to ourselves as well. Um, and if we had a crap test for ourselves as professionals, um, what would we be after in terms of currency? Like, you know, when did we get our qualifications? Well, for some of us, it was actually quite some time ago, it must be said. Um, but hopefully we're maintaining some relevancy. And you are because you're here. So congratulations, I say. Um, relevance, you know, again, that continuing professional development, um, how, how current are the processes and, you know, how forward looking are you in trying to identify the appropriate um, mechanisms we need to manage information and data effectively. Authority, how robust are our approaches, really, truly? Um, you know, it's, it's challenging work. There's no doubt about that. We all know that. Um, but how, how much can we communicate to our communities about what our approaches are and how we are trying to ensure that they're robust? Accuracy, and I think that very much speaks to the integrity of the information that we're providing and the, the way that we engage with that information, the set of values that we, we bring to that, which is really what I'm going to focus on in my session. 
Um, purpose is the last one in the crap test. Um, and I think for us, you know, is our purpose, you know, and the staff that we work with, are we trying to, you know, change the world? Are we trying to leave it in a better place? Um, or are we thinking about 5 p.m. Friday and when can we get out of here? Um, hopefully not. Hopefully we're actually trying to set the bar a bit higher for ourselves. And I think that's an, a really important thing to do as professionals. So we do need to continue to challenge ourselves. Okay, so that's me. Should you need to track me down afterwards, you can. Um, so, are you ready and willing for this conversation? This is the first thing. Um, of course you are. You're here, you're after lunch, you're all, you know, you're well fed and hopefully not too well fed, you're focused. Um, what we're going to look at is some of our ethical frameworks because we do actually have some and I just wanted to remind us that we, we have got some really good tools at our disposal that we're probably not using as much as we should be. Um, our organisations have discovered values in a big way. So can I just have a quick show of hands? Whose organisation has organisational values? Is anyone, you know, yeah. yeah it's, it's taken off, it's everywhere, okay? Uh, I think this is a good thing. Now, some of it is undoubtedly about damage control and trying to shore up reputation, but I think we need to take it on face value and say, yes, this is our stuff. We can, this is a conversation we can contribute to. So this is all leading on to how do we continue to build trust. Okay. So there is a connection between ethics, values and trust. All right. We know what it feels like when we're trusted and we know what it feels like when we trust others because we, most particularly we know what we find if we're not, if, if we're at the short end of the story and we think actually... <laughs> Oh, my trust has been misplaced. You know what that feels like. It's not a good place. And, and I think, as David was mentioning in his talk, about people's lack of trust in their institutions now is something that we need to engage with and think about how can we reposition ourselves as professionals to engage much more positively with the communities that we serve to build trust. Okay? We can't assume it. And I think in the past it's been easy to assume. Right. So what is... Ethics and values, are they different things even? So ethics usually refers to an agreed set of rules or principles which inform our behaviour as individuals. We all face choices every day and many of those choices reflect an ethical decision, whether we're aware of it or not. A code of ethics usually reflects the common beliefs and ideas held by a community or a group. Now, the ethics are about the application of those shared values. Right? So those values might be cultural, organisational, quite personal, but they're, they're, they're subject to change over time. You know? We can see in our community different things are valued in different contexts um, and that's a good thing. You would not want the same values to apply in 2022 that applied in 1922. Our, our expectations have shifted of ourselves, of our communities, about the way we deal with each other, about issues around de equity and diversity and inclusivity in our communities. So they're things that are changing and that's okay. We need to have those conversations and ensure that our behaviours as professionals align with that. I thought this was quite a useful way of differentiating the two things. So values determine what is important and again, that can change over time. Ethics determine what is right. And, and it's, it's a much more concrete, with some teeth, this is what the expectations are to inform your decision making. So, and we are fortunate because our professional associations have spent some effort around this work. So, um, one thing I did want to talk about now. The ones I'm going to focus on today are actually the ones I know best, which are the, 
the Rimpa, ASA and Alia. And Alia asked me to speak today, so, you know, yay, Alia. <laughs> Even though I used to be the president of the Australian Society of Archivists. So, you know, I'm sort of straddling the camps here. And, you know, I've been to my share of Rimpa events too. So, you know, <laughs> I've done my time in all these spaces. Um, can I say that, you know, those three organisations have also collaborated together and particularly around the space of um, accreditation of courses. And so part of that has been looking at what are the shared things that we need to approach around knowledge and skills and values and ethics as, as featured. So we've got a documentation that sort of says when we engage with the universities around the courses that they're teaching that are relevant to us and they're seeking accreditation, that we're having the same conversation. And that's been a really important thing for the society. And we we did that probably about 10 years ago now, and it has really streamlined our accreditation. And I think the universities have also appreciated the simplicity of it. However, what I'm going to do is give you a quick tour of the different approaches of those three organisations, and they are different. OK, so let's start with the RIMPA Code of Conduct. Um, now, that's a 2019 document. I don't know if there was an earlier one. I couldn't see any reference on the website. I did look. Uh, the sort of things that they cover, okay, um, you know, fairly no nonsense, quite, you know, direct and to the point. So, certainly some inclusivity is mentioned. Um, I quite like this one, right? So, actually, let your employer or client know if there's been a breach and carry out all those activities that you're doing, utmost honesty and integrity. All sounds really good. Um, and basically, you know, it is trying to set the bar at a reasonable standard. It's a very well considered document. For me, I thought it was interesting to note what wasn't included. I'm thinking particularly of a, a user perspective, doesn't seem to be informing this document very much. And I think that's that's a gap. So if I was saying Rimpa was going to rewrite it, that's something you could potentially consider. Um, there's also not much around safeguarding rights of access for individuals for information and records, an acknowledgement or of the perspective of the individuals documented in the records. And again, that's a really key thing that I think as a society in terms of our values have shifted. Our expectations are a lot higher in that space now. So, but to be fair, you know, it wasn't written yesterday <laughs> and it's probably due for review. And can I say, wait till I get to the ASA one, because that was written in 1993. So, you know, it's all good. <laughs> We're among friends, OK? <laughs> We're among friends. Um, so RIMPA did also have a brief statement that referenced um, supporting equitable and appropriate access to information, but didn't actually make it into the code. So that's interesting. So um, I'll give you a little quote now. Oh, yes, maintaining trust. Oh, this is where... You know, maintain trust of employers. It's good that trust, I thought trust got a mention, so yay. Trust of their employers, clients and, or stakeholders. So again, not a sense of the people documented in the records or the, the people trying to access the records. Or perhaps they're stakeholders, but that's open to interpretation. Um, I like this quote. Values of ethics of a profession represent an intrinsic element of the professional identity, both individually and collectively. Um, and what I found interesting, that, that's actually not coming in the context of any information management professional. Um, it's done in the context of, of social work. All right? And I actually think there is a lot in that social work discourse around professional identity that applies to us. Um, and, you know, it's something that I guess the ASA has been engaging with, with its um, out-of-home care courses and um, trauma in around related to information management support. So, you know, I think when we look more broadly across our sector in a sense of who is trying to make the world a better place, <laughs> there are some natural allies and places that we can actually go and share information and, and build our own sense of what professionalism looks like and holding ourselves probably to a higher account than maybe we've done in the past. Okay, ASA Code of Ethics, stepping back, 1993, 
I, I'm hoping you were all born in 1993. <laughs> um, I was certainly. <laughs> uh, I was an ASA member then, but I have to say I was, you know, a but, but a blip. <laughs> um, okay, so 1993. You might wonder what they did in 1993. It's actually a really interesting document. Um, and I looked at it critically in preparation for this talk because I thought, oh my gosh, what's this, this, this is going to be cringe-worthy. Um, and look, the language is not ideal. I, you know, it's no doubt about it. It's, you know, it's got a certain flavour to it, but it's got some teeth. It really does. Resist pressure from any sort to manipulate evidence so as to conceal or distort facts. Okay, all right, so good. Um, okay that anyone can use services or consult records in their care without discrimination or preferential treatment. Um, protecting privacy of everybody. And I like the fact that, you know, it was trying to be inclusive in terms of it really was everybody users as well. Um, I was really impressed by this in 1993, okay? I know for some of us it feels like yesterday, but it wasn't. <laughs> was it? Um, you know, without reference, race, colour, sex, orientation, you know, politics, etc. Now, you know, that's probably a longer list today, but, you know, really good stuff, actually. So, all credit. Um, however, as I say, not the most contemporary document in its language. It's very comprehensive. There are 37 clauses to it. Okay. It's, you know, it's weighty. Um, the one thing it doesn't have, which is there's no there's no penalty, right? And this has been a long source of contention in the society, can I tell you? And I've sat through AGMs where this has been pointed out at length. Um, so yes, comprehensive, but there's nothing about processing breaches. And one thing the RIMPA does is say that anyone in, in breach of the code, you know, w you know, their membership may be reviewed or revoked. Okay, so. They missed this in 1993, and, and no one's ever been game to come back and fix it. But Nicola Laurent, who's here, who's the current ASA president, who's doing a great job. <laughs> it's on her list, and I'm very supportive. <laughs> very supportive. Okay, we have done a bit of other stuff in this ethics space. Um, and more recently, we have the professional capabilities matrix. Um, so that was nine in 2016. Okay, now in an ethical fashion, I need to make a disclaimer here <laughs> because I am the author of this document. <laughs> okay, so, you know, all, all shortcomings are absolutely squarely on me. Uh, so this is quite a, you know, and again, you know, <laughs> acknowledge I'm the author. It was intended, and hopefully is, a fairly well nuanced view of what is professionalism, okay? And a very, um, you know, yes, knowledge and skills absolutely is one of seven capabilities, but it also talks about professionalism, rights, justice and the law, values and ethics, which is referenced here, context and organisation, leadership and innovation, and critical reflection. So there's seven capabilities. Now, interestingly, when I was doing my research in 2016, 15 probably I would have started, around the world, looking globally at, you know, what are, what are professional, um, you know, matrix look like? You know, how do we evaluate what the professionalism looks like? And, you know, and basically I was looking in the UK, US, Canada, as well as Australia. And, in, and, the one that actually resonated most for me was the UK um, Social Work Association, would you believe? So at that point in time, that seemed to me to be the most representative of where we were trying to position ourselves in terms of aligning our values with actually contributing to social good. Because I think that's why many of us are in this profession. We want to do this stuff really well because it matters. It is the currency of our democracy, as you know, has been quoted twice. Adrian Cunningham, yeah, yay. So um, now, again, if I was going to be redoing this, if, if Nicola said to me, "Well, what's missing?" <laughs> I did think there is something missing. Now I think there is an eighth capability that's not there. 
Um, and that is, that is really one around, um, I, th I think I would call it probably uh, cultural safety, diversity and inclusivity would be the one. So I would I'd pull it out of rights, justice and the law where it's hidden at the moment and I'd actually make it a separate one. So um, now what else do I do? I do? What I will say about the ethics, the values and ethics capability though, which I was impressed with when I read it recently, because I have to admit I don't look at it very often. Um, you know, it talked about ethical decision making to develop trust. So trust was actually the outcome of this capability. And I thought that was that was great. <laughs> I thought that is a really good reason to have this capability. So uh, and, and very importantly, through partnership with the people who use our services. So, you know, we do have to think and hold ourselves to account as professionals about how we're actually engaging with those who have been, you know, have had far less control and mostly no say in the way that they're captured in the records that we manage. Okay? And, and how do we treat those people and how do we support those people and then support their access is probably says more about us as a profession than anything else. And I think that is, that is a real um, you know, challenge for us ongoing. And we have acknowledged, you know, we all have work to do in this space. When you look underneath this, this capability, there is some behaviours. So each capability has some behaviours that sort of teases out what's required. And that one talks about demonstrating confident application of ethical reasoning to professional practice, rights and entitlements, questioning, challenging others using a legal and human rights framework, and critically manage, or sorry, reflect on and manage the influence and impact of one's own and others' values on professional practice. So it really is acknowledging that this is something that we all bring to our work, and it is better to acknowledge it and to tease it out and understand it than to just, you know, tick the box and move on because you know, we're all being influenced by the background and a whole range of other things in our lives. Okay, that's probably enough of that one. Um, are there ethical frameworks? Right, okay. They're a large organisation with a lot of staff. They've done a lot of things. <laughs> I mean, Ali's done a great job here. So, um, and, and librarians, absolutely very values-driven people. You know, I work with many librarians. I'm a librarian as well, um, as well as being an archivist. So I'll identify with both. Um, core values policy statement. They regularly review things, bless them. I think that's great. <laughs> many of us could learn. <laughs> Uh, they also have a code of conduct. I got a bit confused about what these three documents were, but basically I think the values is very action orientated. This is what we want to do. I'll give you a couple of quotes from that in a minute. And we also have um, this code of conduct, which is really about for members. And then there's sort of a higher level professional code of conduct. Okay. They even have a course, Ethics 101. Okay. And I do want to flag to you this Pathways report, which I'll talk about briefly. So value statement. I'm just going to flick through these, but you know, basically a lot of good stuff, okay, that you would want to see, and I don't think that any of us would quibble about too much, but captured really well, much more contemporary language, you know, tick, um, so that's all good, okay. Pathways project that I mentioned to you, um, what I found was interesting was this. And this is a big document, <laughs> but it is worth a look. There is an executive summary. One of the principal objectives of the Pathways Project is to develop strategies to attract clever people from a wide range of backgrounds to the industry who share the ethos and values of the profession. I just thought that was a really interesting way to frame, you know, where is the profession going? Okay? And I think that's something that all of us in our respective industries need to consider about, you know, with the changing natures of courses and what's been taught in universities, um, you know, where are we going? How are we going to bring people in? What are the key things that matter? And perhaps more than anything, it's about that ethos and values and the skills and knowledge. You can, you can teach that afterwards in the workplace, you know. We need a, we need a diverse and inclusive workforce and this is a, a key way to develop it. 
Okay, talked about organisational values. Um, here's an example from the University of Adelaide, which some of us know and love. And I wanted to tell you that one of the things that we've been doing this year is to have a, uh, a much stronger conversation around values in the library. So what we've asked, we've divided the library staff up into five teams. Each team has a value and they've got a month. And in that month, they have to explore that value. All right, so celebrate it, investigate it, test it, talk about it. Um, it's got people working across teams, um, levels, roles, and to have, you know, in some cases a bit of fun and just get to know each other, but also to look seriously at what is the value conversation? What does that mean for our ethical practice? So I think creating opportunities in our organisations for this discourse and for people us and our staff to engage in the values and ethics is really important. And that's about being professionals. You know, they're hard conversations potentially, but they're really important ones. So what I wanted to do is remind you of this. <laughs> and perhaps to leave you with the thought that we have an opportunity here We've got these great ethical frameworks, you know. There's something there for everybody, could I say. Um, we've got this organisation happening now. We've got our own professional practice. But what I would really like to see is some engagement between those values and our professional ethics. Because I think our organisation at the moment, they're not going to stay interested in values. They're interested in values now. <laughs> so let's leverage that. Let's actually call that ourselves to account and our organisations to account and get involved in that space. That's where I think we could make a real difference. Okay, that's me done. Question. You're all exhausted. Yeah. Thanks, Kylie. Bye. Okay, so um, we're doing a bit of a swap uh, because our, I'm I was due to go next um, but what we're doing is so that uh, Lana's got a um, plane to catch so we just with with all the traveling and stuff we thought we'd um, swap the order of things so Lana Lutman's here with and talking about um, she's her role is global records and information management at Teva Pharmaceuticals and this is going to be a, a, a sponsor it's a it's a sponsored event and it's in conversation with um, InfoGov ANZ. So, so I'll pass it on. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, sorry. Um, also sit on our information. Uh, InfoGov ANZ International Council. Um, as you've heard, she's currently uh, Global uh, Records uh, Manager and Information Management for Teva Pharmaceuticals, which is a global pharmaceutical company. Uh, Alana's uh, started her career at the New South Wales State Archives. She's worked in three continents. She's worked uh, for government, non-for-profit, and uh, for corporate and spent the last 20 or so years based in the US. So I thought it would be great to um, hear from Alana from a global perspective about information uh, governance, information management, what's required of uh, professionals now and going forward based on her experiences. So welcome Alana. <laughs> Students, 
1993 must have been a big year because uh, we've just heard about the the code of ethics. It's <laughs> a lot of action in that year. Um, okay, so listening to the discussion today and where you're at and you're back to the US in two days, what are the key skills uh, that you think are needed for the modern information professional? That is an interesting question. Um, definitely you need to keep up going. That, that's the skill that you need. Um, I think information professionals need to come from a wide array of um, intersections these days. Um, the legal profession, IT profession, um, life science profession, and basically you need to keep uh, up skill. By that, I'm going to do a master's degree, doing a PhD. I don't know what's in the room for me, PhD, but I know on the British Government Council we have. Another member who's also got a PhD. Two. Another two members. Okay, so I think really trying to up the game and increase increase my skills is really important. Um, I know in the States we have the certified account manager, you know, and people who have that account, we do have that. Um, we have um, IAPP, the privacy professional certification. Um, and many people in the room have any of those, but um, I think all these skills are really, really necessary to be working. So, Alana, you started life as the, you know, in the New South Wales State Archive. What have you done to upskill personally, and what are you currently doing or thinking of doing? Uh, so, as I, as I mentioned briefly, um, I, I did a master's in life science at Rutgers University, which is really well. Um, I also have a privacy certification, did the certified records manager certification, and now I'm making moves to do the privacy certification, privacy technology. So, because records these days and privacy are just sort of intrinsically linked, and you know, in large global companies specifically, you always have privacy to do particularly when it comes to retention schedules and if you have to start an organisation because of the privacy laws, you really need to be able to talk and talk and talk and talk to most of the company leads. So that's one of the things I notice when I'm in the US, the cross-section between the merger of people, as Alana's just said, from uh, technology who are focused on privacy, uh, like Peter was this morning when he was talking about the privacy issues and, and the legal requirements, um, but also in relation to uh, the issues around regulatory record keeping with the proliferation of uh, global uh, records, uh, global legislation and requirements and a myriad of uh, functions. So in highly regulated industries like pharmacy, banking, the financial industry, um, record keeping has is is quite challenging. So, what are your perspectives on that? Uh, basically, what I'm seeing now is a little bit of a push and pull between privacy and records. Um, going back to the data minimisation, data protection, privacy legislation. When it comes to creating retention schedules, uh, there's a little bit of friction between the privacy industry seem to think that they almost become records people where records management has been doing this for a number of years and you have to be cognizant of that collections and they're created to you know the, the trust in what data you think about um, individuals. But there's also legislation, regulation, industry body, industry standards, best practices that Creating um, retention period in the minimum ones. So it is a push and pull. So in your current role and in your previous role, which was a global manufacturer based in the US for a European company, what do you think the skills are where you talk about crossing the silos to deal with some of these issues? So intrinsic which is um, collaboration between 
particularly fighting legal business, privacy, security. Those are the main functions, and you need to be able to uh, listen as well. <laughs> it sounds really basic, but just being able to sit in a room with all these different groups. Um, and then, you know, while you can't be like a whole trade, you really do need to have a good grip on where everyone's coming from. If your end goal is to, um, you know, abide by policy, create policy, abide by policy, you really need to have a grip on where everybody's coming from because everybody, everybody has a little vision, and but your goal is in the end to minimize the risk of your company or your organization. How does that all work together? And collaborate and cross and cross functional, all those types of keywords so what are some of the uh, areas where you've seen successes what is that down to when you talk about collaboration how does that look in practice um sometimes it's like when you collaborate and people come and say well, how do i do this <laughs> most people don't want to do it but i feel that now particularly that in the language it's happening it's not coming now it's just happening um, I take the leash and anybody asking me to do this, I have to go to the Quite a lot of these systems. Like, how do we do this? And, and systems are not, I think it's getting better, but systems are traditionally not created to delete. So sometimes to delete something actually costs the company money because you've got to go back and work out actually how, how data comes to you. So I say, I said deletion to be, to be a success. I think also just perhaps having an IG steering committee, so that that's with a charter with groups of you know cross functional business units that need their group to help that can as we've been talking about here eventually report up to the boards if you are CEOs about you know, the status of information quality within the company. So we heard uh, the former Director General of the Archives talk this morning about um, the escalation of matters to the board level who are ultimately responsible, whether it's the governing board in a government agency or an actual board of directors in, in a corporation. But it is this uh, mechanism that you do need to report up. It's how you actually get your message across. So there needs to be a mechanism for that. So is that, are there any other ways that you have seen other than reporting up from the Information Governance Committee? Any other way, sorry, to, to report up to the governing board. Um, also, there, some of the other medicine here, yes, uh, this morning that is something that's probably the most private Um, basically, we, we have also looked at perspective, um, looking at our paper inventory, so we got site whenever you go to destroy your know, heritage structures. Um, your vendor will come and you have to give you a chart and you just put X number of boxes. Um, the carbon footprint of the leasing, how it goes on, how it goes to conserve the wash to um, trees. And so you can also use that reporting up into your, into your box. Check with your For anybody who has a box, so I'm actually not going to use that in the next, um, in the next quarter. Cost of physical storage yeah. and cost of uh, digital storage as well, uh, and understanding how accessible it is or not, as the case may be. So, um, you know, we've just heard in the last session uh, the connection between ethics, values, and trust. Um, in your view, how do you go about creating a trustworthy career as an information professional? So I choose to do three things. Choose trust between me and me, trust between me and my family and me and my community, trust between myself and the organization. So you, you need to be accountable 
So you've made the transition from government to not for profit to corporate. Um, for those who are looking for a change or thinking about a change, how is it? How easy is it or not <laughs> to uh, make that transition? Um, sometimes people have a perception. Sometimes people have a perception and moving over from corporate to the non-profit. A little bit of <laughs> but they were almost like a thing. Hey, um, how you gonna deal with the people? Um, it was mostly work. So, um, which in the end, if you're that's not the way you work. But I think there are perceptions. So for those who might be looking to upskill or those who are at the start of their careers um, and, and looking to make a transition, what recommendations do you have? Um, if I had my time again, I probably would choose the route of what I expect from history, sorry, history of history and then branching out into this information. I believe it was a lot of our lives. If I had my time again, I would probably do it in more IT um, related undergraduate um, or definitely just one more IT in there, have some coding in there, have more um, just just the, just to get a better group. I mean if you learn a lot more along the way, you learn a lot in your job, but I think it's to spend a bit more um, technology in corporate. I'll ask uh, if there are any questions, but whilst people are putting... Oh, David's got one. Yeah. Microphone from out of the cupboard. It's, it's like a magic act. Maybe just a comment about the last comment. Now a huge issue must be cyber, security cyber risks. And I just wonder if you, if you have any evidence that more familiar with what vulnerabilities now exist in information in record due to the evolving nature of cyber. And to what extent they can be getting more expertise in, in cyber security, or do you see that mainly the security? Well, like you said, being in record you, you can't be an expert in this. However, particularly in pharma, with documentation and is anyone here in pharma? Anyone else? No. I mean, so the GAT systems are the highly regulated systems that um, we've settled from the last master trial, clinical trial, master trial. It's the same for universities as well here. Um, R and D, you know, all those um, very highly regulated. So, um, with regards to cybersecurity, you know, to your point, it's crucial. And if I had my time again, I personally would, would have gone the cybersecurity route, but um, you know, it's always an option. But the issue that this identifies is that cybersecurity 
is uh, also part, the protection part is one of the many facets of information management. So when you look at data and information as a sphere, um, you have all these, you know, the record keeping obligations, the uh, regulatory compliance, um, privacy, um, automated reporting, you know, government reporting if you're a university or government agency, um, but if you're a bank or an insurer, you've got all these reporting agencies. <laughs> so data analytics, and then you've got the use of technology as the tool to leverage value, um, and then the cybersecurity risk. So um, <clears throat> how important is, you know, you've touched on collaboration, but culture to actually having effective um, governments of uh, data and information. Definitely. I remember when I was a I would get this part of this with black coach, particularly company questions, particularly working in global corporations. Um, culture play a crucial part in how you interact with your clients. Um, so the way, I mean, even for me coming from Australia, Americans are a little bit of a different, <laughs> whole different little group of people as well. Um, and so when you're, you know, dealing with different cultures, Respectful, and you need to be able to identify. Uh, and it comes back to the listening and the empathy that you want to be such a good But, you? Yes, okay. <laughs> um, just being able to connect, you know, on a professional level, whilst you're understanding the culture of the company. So there's that people, there's also the company's culture, like their risk or their appetite for risk. You know, do they have an aggressive appetite for risk? Do they have minimal appetite for risk? Do they have to report to stakeholders or shareholders? Does that risk? So there's all different types of uh, company cultures. Any other questions? Any thoughts? Yes? Thank you. Hi, uh, so I'm wondering if that policies in go and go home access to the community. Do you have a company in transitioning from go access to the community? So, being a medical pair, so there's a lot of the company, you know, publishing based on medical research, um, published a lot of medical care publications. But, we do, I mean, we have huge data sets. Um, we can quite, um, is that kind of what you mean? Yeah. Do you have a sense of the Not usually publishing the market version, but Right. Honestly, in, in our business in networks, we don't we don't keep their assets in what they publish. We just don't keep their assets. <laughs> uh, have you got any observations on the development of the profession over the last five or so years uh, globally? Uh, I, I believe that, I can't remember buzzwords going all the way through, and people might be able to, to confirm this as well. It started off with record management, record information management, and then kind of moving on to information governance. And for information governance and organisations, it's become a large global corporation. Runs the gamut. You might remember the there's an idea by wheel about the position governance um, the institute of organization. And they can run from record information management through contract lifecycle management through to um, electronic signatures, through to data mining, data analytics, and finally um, monetizing um, information. So I think there's so much scope now for um, and uh, I think it's, 
I think it's been like four and a half to fifteen years. Really, I know my own horizons were broadened and expanding out in archive and moving into information center. Actually, I'm moving into information. What are some of the really critical skills that um, the information profession and records managers have to bring to companies that they need to advocate more for themselves around? I think being in person, having um, soft skills is, uh, is being more physically promoted by the internet. Um, because as I mean, you need to be able to talk to people. You need to be able to circulate throughout the whole organisation because in an organisation, you have what you call sense of area and everybody can get to this. So you need to be able to to talk to your business units and see what they do. <laughs> and not everybody can do that. You know, there's this old fashioned kind of um, stereotype behind the scenes to get them involved with them. That's just work at the table. Um, particularly when you report this to legal. Um, there's the whole area now of um, e discovery and analytics there, which you know, we do a lot of in the States. Um, so be able to have that type of skill of knowing, you know, how to how to organize collections sometimes, you know, the mailboxes, privacy file shares, you know, the list goes on. So I think you have to be open minded. You have to be one on the job to be prepared to keep yourself relevant. Well, that's about the fact check. Um, and, uh, and just keep moving forward. And I think you've got a question. I do. Um, what's the How long have you been in Australia? I've been out of Australia for about 20 years. Hello. <laughs> well, I'm here to comparison of where. From, from where we am, Australia had much more of a continuum of perspective. They kind of date it more, sometimes it can be more archive and you know, records. You know, it's little, it was a little bit more siloed. I don't know whether they do these days, but I feel like it's more kind of there. What is it? That was Australian history. I think what I notice uh, from my time in the US is that there's a lot more interaction between the different professions. So I was in uh, Washington DC last month and part of what I did was doing a technology and privacy course and half the course were technologists. There were lawyers, general counsel, and there were privacy practitioners. It was a real mix of people. And one of the things that struck me um, was the lack of understanding from people who were managing massive data sets and doing incredible things. They didn't know anything about the data life cycle. Uh, so, you know, that's something I think that information and records professionals, it's d their DNA, you know, collection, use, reuse, disposal. Um, disposal and, you know, this intersection with the data minimisation principle, which comes out of the GDPR, but it's also a requirement in the Australian privacy principles, 11.2, and most of the state privacy legislation. It's just never really been talked about until now, but um, I, do you have any comments on that? Yes. It is our job to take care of <laughs> We really need to take care of it. Yeah. When it comes to putting in uh, systems, um, oftentimes they just don't work. <laughs> you know, don't have safety. But um, we've, you know, we've been doing this for a long time. And, you know, to them, the thought of deleting things, deleting information, it's just like they just want to get the men, get going, push it out, move it from test environment to production environment to live environment, and just get it out. So on the back end, you need to be kind of following those developments to get you know, to the end and, uh, and make sure.
sure that that it's done right from the get go. No privacy by design, maybe honestly, you know, very different. I think that's an excellent point. It all needs to be done up front by design, security, privacy, records management. Uh, think about the purpose of what it is you're trying to achieve, what the core purpose of your organisation is, what its objectives are, what the project is, the new technology system is, and, and, and then more work up front in the design. What are some of the mechanisms to make sure you've got that education going on and when you've got, you know, the new latest whiz bang global system going in, how is it that you actually manage that? Is that where culture and collaboration and the IG committee and those sorts of things come into play? Yeah, culture and collaboration. I mean, most business units have like IT programs, so they um, and they teach you that you get to know those people <laughs> and uh, usually you might have an automatic database um, that's where those um, service now is an example of that one that you use for your application by the way. Make sure that the right application that goes to your database because that gets the IT. If you know that the problem is a lot of business units don't know or really don't care. To do things, and uh, but if that information gets <laughs> yes, uh, we're nearly out of time, so it'll have to be the final question. Yeah. Yep. Um, have you seen? I know you probably haven't been in the public industry that long, but have you seen radical changes in information and uh, record management practices, or is it changing legislation? Um, since the crisis. Oh, so that's an interesting question. So since the opioid crisis, has there been any change in the pharmaceutical industry in relation to um, record keeping information management practices? Um, it's been going on for a while. So, you know, it's been a lot of, yeah, <laughs> it's been a lot of information collected, paper, electronic, and all that kind of stuff. So um, the case, as you know, so I think that what's going to come out of the opioid, um, you know, case isn't isn't fully uh, hasn't you know isn't fully um, manifested yet. But basically, it, it comes down to the same rules like record keeping, um, rules of discovery, rules of collection, rules of validation. Um, I think they're all going to remain pretty safe. I mean, essentially, the mm -hmm. case. Is a huge case, but um, you know, for example, the price thing and all those things. They're huge cases, but at the end of the day, they're just more cases. So you don't know that anything huge is going to happen. Well, um, thanks for coming. Join with me in thanking Alana. She's got to catch a plane back to Sydney to go back to the US tomorrow. <laughs>
as, as, as an executive, a data governance executive. And, and the reason why I switched from consulting to execution is because as a, as a consultant, you, you provide lots of great advice, but you're not in control of the execution. And, and I'm a bit of a detailed nut, and I want to make sure that when stuff gets advised that, that I've got some sort of hand in the execution. So I decided to switch over and actually become someone hands-on to actually operationalize the stuff that I was proposing. So I switched over and, and my journey in the last three years has been from a consultant to 18 months at the ACCC as a data governance manager and now at the ANZ as a data governance manager in group risk. So, um, which, so it's, it's a very interesting role, the roles that I've had. And, um, and I'm also vice president of Dharma, Dharma Australia. So um, Dharma, um, Dharma, something like 30 years ago, created the DMBOC, which is the data management body of knowledge. If you've come across it, it's about 600 pages, pages it's this thick. Um, the DMBOC is basically the, the gold standard for data management, data governance, and data quality. And the topics that you were talking about, Alana, was basically completely intersects with the DMBOC. So um, I'm really glad that we're having this conversation. Now, the reason for this topic, um, there's a bit of a backstory to this. Um, back in November, I was watching YouTube, you know, I normally watch YouTube in the morning, you know, at night actually, to help me go to sleep. And there was an ad by Pharrell, the, the, the singer, talking about a new online course for empathy. And, and I thought, oh, is empathy a thing? And, well, it is a thing, but no, but what I mean, empathy is a thing, but to have someone like Pharrell talking about empathy in the middle of a pandemic, it got something like 700,000 views, this, this ad. So I said to myself, okay, it's become a main, mainstream conversation. They're calling it out because they think that there's a, some value in teaching people about empathy, calling it out and actually giving them the skills. So then I thought, well, why not we just talk about data governance and empathy, and um, which, which speaks directly to culture, values, trust, all of those things that we've been talking about all day. Anyway, long story short, um, the MIT were putting out, they've got the CDO IQ conference coming up next year. I put a pitch in, did an abstract to talk about empathy and data governance and got in. So I'm able to, this, this talk here, I'm running as a virtual panel in July this year at MIT. So this is actually a dress rehearsal for me to, to uh, to, to actually test it in front of a real live audience. You know how they do pilots? Well, this is a pilot for, the, for my talk. And the way I'm gonna do it is, um, it's half an hour, but it's gonna be interactive. I'd, li I'd like to hear your views. So I'll talk for 10 minutes, some of that, and just open up the floor and just get a conversation happening. So how's that going so far? Good? Uh, Whoops, I don't know which, how to, I gotta work out how to press the buttons here. Okay, so, so what's empathy? Well, I Googled it, of course, and I found, I found a, a definition that I thought was really close to my heart. So it's, it's got no script. It's about making sure that you get into someone else's skin, essentially. Come out of your, your zone and be part of someone else's world. And so, so that's... Um, and the thing is, and the way you, the why you do that is because you want to help them feel that they're not alone, that you, that you're part of their world. Because if we if we bring ourselves together with other people, we can actually become better, both for themselves and ourselves. So, so the so so empathy is really the ability to understand and share the feelings of another. It's one of that's one of the definitions I found. Now, when you look at the definition of data governance. It's the exact opposite. It's about policy and command and control. So you ask yourself, well, how do you successfully execute data governance? If you're only doing about stick, how do you generate the carrot? You know, data governance is about generating carrot, uh, the stick, enforcement and control, make sure the assets get managed well. So I, I thought, well, 
there's actually a conversation here to talk about how you effectively operationalize data governance through the carrot, through the engagement of the human. So, so I pitched that to, to MIT and they, they liked the idea. So um, the abstract that I've sent up to MIT is actually in the appendix of this, of this deck. So you're quite welcome to read it. So I wanted to talk about how you, how you navigate through the, the conflict between the carrot and the stick. How do you get someone through, empathy, through being empathetic with someone, engage their heart and soul and their mind to do what you want to do, but at the same time, give them something back in return. So, so this is really the talk about, this is the subject of this talk, is having that conversation about um, empathy, which actually stems to trust values. And, and we talked about cultural ad alignment or empathy. You can't have cultural alignment if you don't understand where the organization wants to go. So you've got to have an empathy for the culture of the organization and the individuals in it. So, so my, my talk's really about optimizing uh, the data governance journey, which could be the same as information governance. It's, it's the same, almost the same conversation, but different. But it, uh, data governance, information governance, and knowledge governance, they're, 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 they're spectrums. It's a spectra here. Yeah? So, right, so, so if you haven't seen this already, this is probably quite ubiquitous. It's the, the DMBOK wheel. Data governance is in the middle. It's got 11 knowledge areas. Um, plenty of reference materials on the, on the net. And if you, and you're going to read the book, it's a textbook. And, and taking a textbook and operationalizing it is not easy. So the DMBOK's a great piece of work, but to make it work for an organization requires a lot of work, which probably means that people like me get out there and do the work that we do. So I thought in my presentation, I'd, I'd, I'd come up with some, you know, spitball some ideas about what's empathy to me, what, what I would consider empathy and what I don't consider empathy. So I thought I'd write a checklist. And I think the, 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 the list on the right is probably more relevant for me because I've noticed in my career that corporates take the data governance textbook they create a bunch of training learnings you know tick and flick processes and they go to the business units and say here make it happen and guess what it doesn't happen so and it doesn't happen because um, the corporate wants an objective but it doesn't get into the heart and minds of the business units who are, who are there to actually operationalize the work so, and I think the, the gap for me was the fact that there was a disconnect. They both wanted the same thing, but they were approaching it from different directions. So I think what I'm trying to say in, in this is that um, command and control in the 21st century doesn't work. If you want to be effective, you've got to get into the skin and the hearts and minds of the, of the stakeholders that you're working with. And then on the flip side, You've got to, as an empathetic professional, you've got to understand what are the motivators and the demotivators for the individuals that you're trying to work with, the stakeholders, whether it be external or internal. So that's where I started to think. So I would, lo I would love to hear your thoughts on that. I mean, I'm workshopping this with you. What do we think?
Thank you. I, uh, I, it was a conversation I thought we needed to have as a, as a you know, broad domain of professionals in the you know, data, knowledge and information management and governance. So thank you. I really appreciate the feedback. Any, any, please. Oh, sorry, I'll get you. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Really good feedback, thank you. Hi, Hi Susan. Thank you, thank you. I uh, the reason for the, the the other reason why, along what you've just said, is that with COVID, we've actually called out people's well-being as being the norm. Now we talk about it now like it's normal. Before COVID, it was it was on the way up, but it wasn't normalised as much as it is today. So, I think I think what we're missing is that we're not teaching people the skills to be empathetic, in a structured way. I mean, I picked it up because I wanted I wanted to have some thought leadership to it. You've done it because you, you've latched onto it as being the silver bullet, perhaps, to getting something. But we as an organisation, we as, a, a, as professionals, I don't think we've actually normalised the, the training that we need to do to give people the skills to, be, to show visible signs of empathy. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I think it's uh, an area of growth. I really hope it is. And I wanted this audience to give me, a, it be a litmus test for me to see if it actually resonates. Seems like it does, yeah? We've got some, we've got some more. Hi, Kylie. Yep. Yeah. 
the sphere can be due to negative behavior. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So my um my now that now that we're talking about that, um, in my role as a practitioner. I ask my stakeholders, my client, how am I going? I ask for feedback. It's not just about, and it's not just vacuous words, it's actually genuinely understanding whether what we're talking about is actually resonating and delivering some thought process that actually delivers some di something different. Because I suppose that's, that's how I've, I've approached it, but it's gotta be a structured process. I think what we're saying is that the, the, the conversation has to be structured and it has to be outcome focused. And we've got, I think we've got to do more about directing people through those conversations and having those conversations with a certain determinate outcome in mind. I think. Now, does, that, do, does that sort of response? I, hello. Yep. Yeah, culturally sensitive would be part of it, absolutely big part of it. Um, I've put in there about, um, in my role as an expert, I, when I'm front, in front of people, who aren't at that level of expertise, I have no expertise, I actually become neutral so that I don't be seen to be dominating or leading a conversation down a path that shouldn't, it shouldn't go down or will be uncomfortable for the recipient. So I think we've got to be really sensitive to, um, to uh, where the locus of power is and the fact is in a, in a situation where as a change agent, uh, for it to be the most effective, it has to be um, equivalent. There's got to be equality between the stakeholder and the provider or the, in, the agent. So, and I totally understand that it's culturally, it depends on the recipient, on the person that you've got in the room and being sensitive to uh, their fears and challenges, which might be stemming from either uh, some sort of cultural bias or whatever. Totally hear you. I, I totally understand that. Yeah. 
Okay. Okay. Any any thoughts on that? I mean, is it staff? I so I didn't hear. So maybe with the microphone it'll be. Thank you, because we can hear it. Thank you. Right. So we need to release the pressure. Take the cork out and put it back in and release the pressure at the same time. It's it's multiple layers of the onion here, isn't there? Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yep. 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 I see DG data governance as a way of manufacturing the refining the asset for future use. You've got to build the asset, make sure it's of known quality, make sure it's valuable and current, and use that as a way of actually monetizing it or valuing it or delivering some other corporate value or, or organizational value or social value. But if you don't have the investment, you won't get the return. And maybe it's, maybe, um, maybe having um, a, a, a human conversation with stakeholders actually can open up those sort of real, the real, the real benefits and the, and the challenges, I think, to deliver. How are we going for time? It'll be my own time. Yep.
Okay. Yep. Okay. So it's a value add on top of the base compliance layer. Yeah. Um, I think we're cl we're close um, we're close to the end. I mean, for we're, so we can have some coffee and take a break and come back in a quarter of an hour. But I've also got some references here. So when you get the, when you get the pack, you'll be able to look up some references that, that we've been able to research so far. So, and, I, and I'll, I'll go back to the YouTube um, stream and actually pick up on all the things you've mentioned in here and actually try and find more references. And you're quite welcome to email me with um, any, any research pieces or, or case studies that you think would be useful. I'd love to hear them because I want to incorporate that into the story that, that I want to tell. And for the July session, it's actually a panel. It's not just myself. So it's, uh, we're doing with a panel of five people from around the world uh, virtually. So this is all going to help. This is all going to help our conversation with um, the delegates at the conference. So anyway, so anyway, that, thank you for your feedback. I hope that's been useful. Thank you. So, coffee. Can, can we, look, I think the program says 15 minutes. Can we do 10 because we really could, could use the time? Yeah, could, you, could that be okay? Thank you.
solutions, yeah? Is um got a what the, what's inside it, Nancy? Some chocolates and tea and candles and some Baileys and cups. <laughs> That's attractive for a Monday afternoon. Have we got everyone in the room? Not yet. Can I ask everyone to drop a card in if they haven't dropped in a card? Yeah? Uh, just before we do the draw, has everyone put it uh, there? So um, she's a member of the newly formed, let me put my glasses on so I can see it, newly formed SA Library and State Records Aboriginal Reference Group. Her topic today will be State Archives Reinforcing the, the Colonial Gaze and it's sponsored by the Australian Society, Society of Archivists. Please welcome Jenny Caruso, Dr Jenny Caruso. Although, can you hear that? Is it yeah. on? Oh, it's on. Can you hear me? It's on. Okay. Because I have been married to an Italian for 45 years. <laughs> so, you know, not to stereotype, but conversations can get very loud. <laughs> and being shorter and a woman, <laughs> sometimes I've had to... Do I need this? Uh, yeah, so people can hear. Uh, all the way through. Okay, and this is the clicker thingamig? Yeah. Cool bananas. 
Excellent. So good afternoon, everybody. I'm glad you actually had uh, some afternoon tea and some coffee because if I was going to be before afternoon tea, I was going to get you to do a bit of bend and stretch <laughs> because we all know that when it hits three o'clock, your body's saying, I want to go home now. Um, so, uh, and uh, thank you for the uh, opportunity to speak at this very significant event. As an Eastern Arundel woman, I acknowledge that this land we meet on today are the traditional lands of the Ghana people and I respect their spiritual relationship with their country. I pay respects to the cultural authority of Aboriginal people visiting, attending from other areas of South Australia and internationally. The title of this presentation is State Archives, Reinforcing the Colonial Gaze, a discussion on the ways in which the unfriendly user access processes of state records and archives concur confirms for Aboriginal individuals, families and researchers that the aspiration for truth telling in such archetypal spaces requires an unfaltering deconstruction of the colonial gaze. I just had a friend comment on Facebook that she thought it was a brilliant title and my response to that was, well, in academia, we're taught to have really long titles to our <laughs> papers to show that we are A, an authority, and B, we know what we're talking about. <laughs> so while planning for this presentation, I began to think about the ways in which the colonial gaze is ever present in the lives of Aboriginal people here in Adelaide. And I thought about the symbols of the colonial past that are evident both on the drive into the city but especially those in the immediate vicinity of the State Library. Looking at this photo of the library, I became aware of the way in which my gaze was drawn across the north side length of several blocks of North Terrace, where the library is situated, and engaged in a process of refining and further defining my understanding of the ways in which the unfriendly user processes of record and ar archives can confirm for Aboriginal individuals, families and researchers that truth telling in such archetypal spaces requires a deconstruction of the colonial gaze. My focus shifted from looking at the inside workings of the archives and the libraries to examining the colonial reinforcements Aboriginal people face on our way to and into the archives and libraries. Immediately, immediately in front of the library is a statue of the poet Robbie Burns, presented, to, presented by the Caledonian Society to commemorate Burns and to celebrate the Scottish presence in South Australia. The other photo is the statue of King Edward VII, standing right out there at the front, eldest son of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert, who was known both for his role as peacemaker in foreign affairs and for his philandering. Prior to his ascension to the throne, Prince Edward was a leading light in London society, spending his time drinking, eating, gambling, shooting, horse racing and sailing. We also have the building that we are standing in, the site of the first colonial public library of Adelaide, and we are next door to the Mortlock Library. If we look to the left, standing on that side of North Terrace, if we look to the west, we see Old Parliament House, the seat of British lawmaking of the province, where legislation dictating the treatment and control of all Aboriginal people in the province was passed into law and then carried out by the colonial powers. Next to it is New Parliament House, where those legislative practices continued, and of course, Government House. Moving back to the east of the library, we have the museum, which only recently, in the span of time since colonisation, has begun to repatriate the remains of Aboriginal people and artefacts from all over South Australia and the Northern Territory. Our ancestors have been incarcerated in these stone walls for 200 years. This quote is from Jason Tamaru in a recent piece in The Guardian. The remains of thousands more ancestors are still being sought by Indigenous nations across Australia, 
despite the existence of a federally funded program for more than 30 years to repatriate them from collections in Australia and across the world. Their bodies ended up in universities, medical schools and in the hands of private collectors. But museums cannot be forced to return human remains. The South Australian Museum alone collected the remains of about 4,600 mostly Indigenous people. Just along the ways we had the sandstone edifice of the University of Adelaide. There were so many images, so I thought I'd just include this one, <laughs> especially since it's only been very recently in the history of the university for Aboriginal people to gain entry and enrolment. Again, until recently, the university held the remains of our ancestors who were used for medical and scientific analysis of the Aborigine. Front and centre of the university is the statue to Thomas Elder, after whom Elder Hall is named. Elder migrated to Adelaide in 1854, forming a partnership with Robert Barr Smith, after whom the university uh, library is named, and Edward Stirling. Stirling, while being influential in the suffrage movement and the granting of the vote to women in the state, is also quoted as saying, the earlier you can take those half-caste children away, the better, with the age of three being the optimum. Thomas Elder was an enthusiastic and practical supporter of exploration and saw the camel as the answer to the transport problems of the outback. His first imported batch of breeding camels included three types for speed, stamina and strength. My great-grandfather, Sultan Muhammad, was one of those Afghan cameleers who had a business arrangement with Elder to bring him to South Australia and use his camels to open up the interior. I have decolonised this statue, this statue because one of, the uh, one of the plates on the base has a plaque of an explorer, explorer with camels. This is my great-grandfather's statue. Probably one of the only statues around which there is no association with the colonisation of Aboriginal people is the Scotsman on Scotty's Motel at Scotty's Corner in Medindi. It is one of my earliest memories of Adelaide after being sent here from the half-caste children's mission of Croker Island. Of late, there has been some recognition of sites that are important to Aboriginal people. At Piltawadley, there is acknowledgement of the site of the first native location in Adelaide on the banks of Karawirapari, otherwise known as the Torrens River. While there is a plaque commemorating the site, there is a deeper text that is not highlighted, and that is that the native location was first designated by Interim Protector of Aborigines William Wyatt as the distribution of Rations Point for Aboriginal people whose food sources had been decimated. It was also purposed to house Aboriginal children and in time prevent them from returning to their families. To some extent, work is being done to create breaks and decolonise the, spa the space. The State Library commissioned the Ghana greeting stone carved with a greeting from esteemed and highly respected elder Uncle Lewis O'Brien. Now, how do I click on this link? Just here? Okay. I want it to get onto that. I want to open that if I can. It may or may not. Okay. Okay. Bring it up big. Cool bananas. So if you click on that link, and have I got this mouse the right way? I'm so really good techno technologically. <laughs> you know, believe me, it's not cultural. So I want to scroll down, scroll down, so we can see that these are what are at the front of the library and what you can see, all right? Now, what I want you to do, can you scroll up just a little bit back up? 
what I want you to do is to have a look at this link that's from the state government on the artworks outside uh, the library. And I want you to see if there's anything that particularly jumps out to you uh, about this information that's available on this site. Anything? On the 5th of May, 1894, in 1920, the buildings of Adelaide were floodlit. In July, 1920, on the 15th of July, crowds gathered for the unveiling of the statue of King Edward VII in front of the Institute building. There is no date put where or when the stone, the Ghana greeting stone, was laid on this site. So it would have been a significant event for the library, would have been a lot of money spent for the library, a long time negotiating it, but it's not worth a date a colonial date, yes, but it's not worth a date where we are engaging with the local community in order to bring about recognition of Aboriginal people in, in the state. Okay, I've finished with that one. Following on from that, I'd like you to look again at the entrance to the library and point out where you can see the Ghana greeting stone. A couple of you closest to the window, just pop up and look outside. Yeah, I mean it. Pop up, look outside. Where can you see the Ghana greeting stone? Just in front of the door. Yeah, where everybody walks, any. Yeah. Okay. These are all edifices of settler colonialism, colonialism which reinforce white as the dominant power in discourses on access, entry into, reasons for exclusion from. For Aboriginal people, these surrounds and our egress into them is accompanied by the knowledge that the essential character and construction of these places continues to be fixed firmly in colonial power. The library and archives also contain, hold, hide the remains of our ancestors and there our words and there our records are extant artefacts of our lives. Having looked at the surrounds, we also need to examine and evaluate the practices within the walls of archives and libraries to build trust and information when working with Aboriginal people in archives, white benevolence must be recognised and dismantled. We need to interrogate the work of professionals who often pro profess to support Indigenous peoples, yet reproduce the narratives that uphold colonial supremacy. White benevolence is a form of paternalistic racism that reinforces instead of challenges colonial hierarchies and its presence is found in all our colonial institutions. An analysis of processes which can emerge as gatekeeping also needs to occur. So when we have a look at the records, the GRGs, the MRGs, the GRSs, can somebody tell me what they stand for? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So they're coded. <laughs> Coding is gatekeeping. Redaction is gatekeeping. We look for our records and we go in and there are big black lines. I mean, when writing uh, The Last Protector, Cameron Rains, was denied access to various archives and sources 
and they were very, very heavily redacted. This was on the heels of the success of the um, Trevorrow case, which meant that uh, the state government paid a great deal of money of compensation to Brother Boy Trevorrow uh, as a member of the, uh, of the Stolen Generations. So redaction has taken on a different meaning and a life of its own. So who are these processes set up to benefit? How do these processes reinforce settler colonial power? While the State Library has worked to decode the archives as they relate to Aboriginal people, it's problematic when payment for various resources is required. I won't go on to the uh, click on the link, but I'll tell you, this is $35, OK? This is a crucial resource for anybody who's working in Aboriginal research and Aboriginal for Aboriginal researchers. As you can see, I use it, OK? I am deciphering the codes that are in here for my own use and for my own uh, records. And I'm also deciphering them for people of the stolen generations who are looking for their own records and going back uh, in, their, um, in their families. So, and there's another um, set of records that's available in there that's going to cost $35. I can afford $35, generally speaking people can't afford $35. It has to be for a specific purpose. And certainly the majority of Aboriginal people who wish to keep this as part of their records cannot afford $35. So as Aboriginal people, we seek to build a foundation of trust grounded in unfaltering deconstruction of the colonial gaze these archetypal spaces present. To engage in truth-telling requires a re-evaluation of the ways in which the archive numbering system is a deterrent to Aboriginal people searching for or researching their own individual and clan group history. The barriers are in plain sight. The architectural surrounds and the iconic symbolism tells us that non-Aboriginal colonial history supersedes and holds precedent over and above the history and memory of the colonised. Now, David, you mentioned, David, your name? Cool bananas. David mentioned uh, that when we're looking at the archives, we're, you know, we're now looking at, at when it comes to reconciliation. Uh, when it comes to the Uluru Statement of the Heart, yay labour, okay? It's already happening. We already want that information. I'm chair of the Stolen Generations um, Organisation here in South Australia. I have always al already had questions about, from our membership, how do we access these archives? And so we will be a point, hopefully, to be able to enable our Stolen Generations and other community members to access, access but the, the demand is going to, grow, to go, is going to grow. When we look at truthfulness of what's in the archives, in 2017, the state government set up its um, Stolen Generations Reparations Program. They identified from index cards that there were 300 um, Stolen Generations peoples in South Australia. Going through my research and looking at my removal and the removal of my brothers and sisters, I noticed that one of my documents said that we were removed under the State Children's Council legislation of South Australia, 1898. So therefore, we were a South Australian responsibility. I took that information to a number of politicians and they took it right up to the top and they had to change the inclusion criteria to include Northern Territory people because we'd been taken under South Australian legislation. And this was something that I simply knew because I was researching. And then I was able to tell other community members that this was happening. And I'm really proud because what came out of that was that there were 28 other people who were taken from the Northern Territory under this legislation who became eligible. So when we look at um, 
you know, the index cards in particular, 300 index cards or index cards that said there were 300 people who were eligible for compensation. The Healing Foundation, the year after, found that there were 2,600 stolen generations people in South Australia. So as an organisation, we are looking at ways to talk with Kaim Ma about all of this kind of stuff, to talk with the archives, to talk with the libraries. So how do we access this information to respond to the requests that are coming from both stolen generations and from uh, Aboriginal people in the community? This clearly demonstrates the vital importance of the Tandania Declaration, which seeks to identify key issues faced by Indigenous peoples and archives, examine options to develop a proactive international agenda for preserving Indigenous languages and oral history, explore the vital role of archives in supporting truth-telling and reconciliation and consider approaches to redesigning archives to support decolonisation. There's quite a lot in there. Big stuff, big work to be done. Out of that, we had the Aboriginal Reference Group, of which I'm proud to say I was invited to, uh, to be a member. Um, and we are looking at uh, improving the availability of archive material and services relating to Aboriginal people and cultures provide feedback and advice on both organisations, activities, services and policies relating to Aboriginal people and cultures. The following is the poetry of colleague, academic, researcher and Aboriginal reference group member, political and archival activist, Dr Natalie Harkin from her collection, Archival Poetics, Colonial Archive, 2019. Appetite for the archive is whetted. Fever burns an irrepressible desire to return to the origin and disrupt, rupture with astute decolonising intent. Prepare to be drip fed, access denied. GRG voted files that fuel this fever. Hungry for paper trails that guide a perpetual search for a new meaning between colonial, anthropological and administrative representation that seek loved ones lost and found in stories that unravel on ardent hearts, pulsing officially logged accounts. The invisible is made visible here and the epic story unfolds to finally reveal the state and its dystopian drive to institutionalise, assimilate, control, categorise, collect, contain Aboriginal lives. There is violence here Nothing neutral or innocent in sites that function on paradox logic, recover and preserve, protect and patrol, discard and conserve, revere and demonise, impress and suppress, regulate and repress, remember and forget, alive and dead. Monolith sites feasting on records, bones, flesh buried deep in this crime scene, dormant, waiting for that cusp of light to shine new inquiry, meaning and magical traces in dust and the in-between almost translucent fragile fading folds. Bear witness, rage, feast, mourn, wake up. Thank you. Yeah, as long as they're not too crazy. Uh, oh. Thanks so much, Jimmy. Um, can we do five minutes of questions? We need to move on to Anne. So, um, that's the question. So, anyone would like to take the next? Thank you. Oh, there you are. Yes. Um, where's, where's it? Yeah. <laughs> it really, um, well, it's, it's surprising to think that there's this, this opportunity. Mm. You mentioned earlier 
Yes. Well, firstly, lift that greeting stone up and put it somewhere that can be read by people in Adelaide, by people coming in, by people coming from all over the world. Give us the same level of presence as you have Ronnie Burns and the philanderer out the front, <laughs> okay? Um, and the thing is, you can't undo these edifices. I love them. You know, I'm an historian. I just sort of like go, you know, these are so amazing. And then I go over to Europe and go, these are so amazing. But remember where these edifices are built. What are they built on? They are built on a library. They are built on an archive that was here before the first stones were laid. Keep that in your thoughts when you are coming in here and working in here. Or remember that there is this incredible breadth of knowledge that each Aboriginal person brings with them when they come to have a look. And they'll start yarning. They'll start telling you stories and you look at the clock and you go, oh my God, it's lunchtime, does. But within that is a history embedded uh, um, within itself. But I, I suppose from the reason why I did this is for you to keep in mind that this is what we pass through. This is what we, we walk through. So we don't just see them as fantastic buildings and incredible architecture. We see them as sites of colonisation. We see them as sites of taking us away. We see them as sites of, of examining our bodies and building policies and then making policies. Um, and so our, our vision of them is, you know, what Uncle Lewis would call a 40-40 vision rather than a 20-20 vision. So it's just something I'd like you to um, build into your recollection and, and your approach when you're working in uh, the archives and, and working in the, in the libraries that it's, it's bigger than what you are just looking at in, in that particular instance, that there's this huge circular um, thing that's, go, that's going on and there's a life that's outside of here that informs inside of here. Please don't ask me anything technical. <laughs> It's it's only just emerging. Well, it's that's true, yeah. because the Maori indigenous people could more about that. I would have thought we'd been about the same level. And now mm -mm. all of the dark big nasty things protests being done in New Zealand and government departments have quite strong mm -hmm. processes about uh, I think the male is only their own culture, mm -hmm. which is the issue about um, it should be known by the indigenous people, both here in Australia, New Zealand, and North America. Yeah. Why do you think that might be? Well, I think it's because 
What is the difference between Australia and New Zealand? Treaty. Populations. Treaty. It was built into one of the two versions of the Waitangi Treaty. Uh, and uh, um, Maori people have used that particularly from the 1970s to determine the way in which education is carried out, to, to determine um, uh, the way in which language is taught, uh, Maori language is taught. They have a mandate. We have no mandate. So what we are working from, in some ways, are promissory notes. And, uh, and we have to, you know, we work from reconciliation statements and we say, that is your mandate, that is your promissory note. This is what you must do with it. And so it happens in clusters from state to state. Um, and, uh, but there is, it is emerging and there's a lot of discussion around how do we capture um, this data and uh, how do we um, uh, ensure that that data is uh, under Indigenous control? What does it look like? You know, all of, the, all of those mechanisms are being looked at at, at the moment. Cool bananas. <laughs> yeah. So I might just grab myself a coffee. That's all right. Yeah. Uh, I'm everybody needs no Have I taken the microphone off? And the microphone. Oh, you're right. Is it just the big button? Okay, I'm going to change it up a little bit. We've been talking all day today, and I'm a mover, sorry, live streamers. Um, we've been talking all day today about trust and about um, the, the core, our core business and processes. And we then, I think, um, Kylie touched on um, about us as individuals, and I want to talk a lot more about that and where, why we are where we are and what we can do to improve it. So I want to ask, who here feels sometimes they're unheard as an information management professional in your organisation? I was going to say, could you put your hand up because you spoke to me earlier about where you're from. You said you're not always heard. Yeah? Sorry, yeah, yeah, you. Sorry, I, mean, I will dob you in. I will dob you in. Anyone else? Unheard? Not always heard? Not listened to? Not thought about? Yes? Yes? Yeah, actively ignored. Okay. Oh. So, Deb, do you often I say, do you, and I've got a movie theme going on, so I will ask you about these particular movies if you know who, what they are. But as I've just said, do you often feel as practitioners unheard? Who knows the movie, name of the movie? Well done, well done. You get a free drink at the end of today. <laughs> Everyone else does too. So how often as we as information professionals feel that we're unheard? Quite a lot from what I can gather in the room. Why aren't we always part of the decision per, per, um, process when we're purchasing IT or anything that's got to do with information management? Who here is involved in um, being part of when you, that your organisation buys a new system? You are, so you are heard. Okay, okay. anyone? So there's a few people in the room that have, have been involved. Why is information not a major part of every organisation's strategic plan? Is that the case? Is information management specifically identified in your organisation's strategic plan? It is. Put your hand up if that's the case. It was? No, no, I'm saying, is it, is it now? <laughs> right? Why is information not considered sexy? Do you think it's sexy? Absolutely. What would we do without it? I'm not saying that you need sex all the time either, but, but <laughs> what would, no, seriously, what would organisations do without information? Why do our peers appear to do everything to avoid us? You said, 
You clearly said that you actually avoided. Is that correct? Yep. Yep. Yes. How often do you put in systems or new processes and they do everything to avoid it? How often do they do something to avoid it that actually takes longer to avoid it than to actually do it in the first place? Seriously, they'll go out of their way to not do it when they could have done the right thing in the first place. Why are we not always the first port of call when there's an information management issue? Think about it, who, who are you gonna call? But who do they go to if they've got a financial issue? Where do you go? Accountants, yes? Yeah, go to accountant. If you've got a legal issue, where do you go? To a lawyer. If you've got something wrong with your car, where do you go? If you've got something wrong with information management, where do you go? Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. They just don't know, do they? They just don't know. It's just not in their head like all those other occupations are. So how do we become invisible? Who knows this movie? It's easy. It's the recent Invisible Man, yeah. Yeah. Um, what was, we, we, we're the big part of the problem, guys. We caused it. We sat back and let ourselves be unheard. That's my opinion. Does anyone disagree? We were talking about skills earlier today. Talk about personal skills. Personal skills means that we need to get out there we need to have marketing skills, we need to have communication skills, we need to sell. Yes? Does anyone disagree? Okay, we're all really good at what we do. We're all great records or information managers or archivists or librarians, whatever it may be, but are we actually any good at marketing and communicating? We talked about empathy. It's part of this communication, all of that, it's all part of it. We have ourselves to blame, so how do we fix it? Does anyone know this one? I love this scene. Have you ever been, has anyone watched Monsters, Inc? Yeah, she goes, get out of here. It's down the basement, which is a bit of a thing that bothers me. That's perception is that that's where records managers or information managers belong. So you've got, these are a few things. I'm gonna go through, through them all. You need to know your organisation. We've talked about this all day. Collaboration, gaining trust, educate. Um, Alana spoke about education before. Communicate, you've got to demonstrate value and we've got to deliver. Okay, so know your organisation. Don't assume they know what you do and don't assume that you know what they do. Records managers have got this habit of thinking that we know the business really well and we do. We know, we, don't get me wrong, we do know it well but we don't know it to the detail that we need to know it in. Don't, and as I said, don't assume they know what you or your team have to offer. I've worked, as, I used to work as a consultant and I used to go and speak to, and do, and I'm sure any other consultant has done it too, spoke to business units and say, oh, well, how do you feel about records? Who are they? You know, they're the people that, you know, that's how you get your correspondence every day, that's how you get your emails. Oh yeah, what else do they do? They've got no idea. They don't even know where they're located. Any big organisation, don't even know where they sit. You must understand the, people, the problems people face daily. Empathy, put yourself in their shoes, understand. Is senior management on board with information management? How many people have got support from above? Yeah, no. Not even, probably not even 10% of the room. Why have you, got, you haven't got support from above? Okay. Does other people feel that way? They feel that they don't have that support from senior management? Let's do that question. Who feels they don't have support from senior management? Oh, okay, we're not, we've got people who are abstaining from voting here. <laughs> What's the information culture in your organisation? Right? Is there, uncertainty is poor and creative is good, but what's the culture? It's got to, be, it's got to have a good culture. That comes from senior management. Who are the influencers? Who's the influencer on the screen here? Don't we wish we had one of her in all our organisations? Oprah Winfrey. As soon as she says something's good, everyone buys it. Right? As soon as she says, makes any statement, everyone goes with it. Everyone believes it. She's trusted. She's got credibility. They're the influencers in your organisation. Who's got some good influence? Who, who, did, who can give an example of an influencer in your organisation? Just a position. Yeah, go for it. Here. I'll do my own microphone. It's okay. 
<laughs> I, I'm I'm using my Yep. To leaders right through to to the users and uh, and getting that buy. And even listening is a huge part of that. Yeah, absolutely. But who who can talk to who? If you were going to put a new system in, I'll ask you again. If you want to put a new system in, who would you go to to help you get your message across? Yeah, yeah, influencer. Other PA to your CEO or your DG or your executive management, that PA, gatekeeper. We talked about gatekeepers just before. Gatekeeper. If you can get them on side, you've got a winner. Who else? People have been in your organisation for a long time. They've got credibility. They've got knowledge. People listen to them. They're influencers. So you don't all have to be Oprah Winfrey, but there are lots of influencers in your organisation. So collaborate. Get out of the office. We're renowned for being in the basement, guys. Get out of that basement. Move on. What's wrong? Oh. Yeah. 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 Good point. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Identify what the business want, need. You need to, to talk to them. You need to get out. Right? Treat the sessions like you're a consultant. You know nothing. Who knows what's on the Tuesday? Who knows this TV show? David. Hogan's Heroes, yeah. Yeah, get yourself out, get yourself into the depots, into the tea room, social club events. I know that sounds, some of you might not find that overly appealing, but can I tell you, some of the best conversations, some of the best decisions are made in an informal environment. All right, it's good to get to people. You're forming relationships. People learn about trust. They know about your family. You don't have to tell them everything, but you know they know a little bit more about you, so you gain more trust. Invite, collaborate. Invite managers for a chat over coffee. I know that sounds silly, but it's very trendy. Instead of sitting in an office, have a meeting, now go and have a coffee. If you've got somewhere close by, here at State Library, they've got um, cafes and that all around. Go and have a coffee. Invite yourself to meetings. Get yourself out there. Get yourself into those meetings that make a difference. All right? Don't sit in the basement. Don't sit at your desk. It doesn't work. Right? And you've got to get yourself out there. Be, go to team meetings. Put yourself on the agenda. Say you're going to be there for five minutes. I'll guarantee you're there for 15. Tell them, let them tell you the problem. If they've got a problem, let them tell you. That's fine. Listen. Put information management on the executive management meeting agenda. If you can, I know it's hard. Meet with the influencers, all your Oprah Winfrey's in the world. And you and your team, you need to be proactive. You need to sell this message every day. Who knows this movie? Come on. I'm Italian too. The Godfather. Yes, we take nothing. We make sure we do it. Wouldn't we love to have that too? Gain trust. Who knows this movie? Yeah. <laughs> Every time you address a group, they're assessing whether or not you're telling the truth. We do it. We're just human. That's what we do. You need to talk. You need to know what you're talking about. You need to be passionate. If you're here today, you're passionate about what you do. You need to be able to sell that. Okay? You've got to be able to prove that you're trusted to tell truths. Don't exaggerate. Don't pretend, don't make things up, and don't try and don't make things up. Don't try and answer things you don't know the answer to. Use language that people understand. Get rid of jargon. Um, um, Jenny just before, and I know she said it in a different way, but the coded stuff, but there was someone in the back that knew exactly what those three acronyms meant because it's jargon. To me, that's jargon. We all use it. Government are renowned for using jargon. Empathise with the issues, which um, Andrew's already spoke about. Small fixes can be big wins. Anyone that's gone out and spoken to the business and they turn around and they say, I can't put security on a particular document or an access control, and you show them, and it's really simple, they love you forever. It's a silly, silly little thing. You know what it is? They just didn't know how to do it. So when they don't know how to do something, what do they do? They fear it and they hate it. It's just human. That's who we are. Always follow through with what you say you're going to do. I said, don't make promises you can't keep and participate in big projects, big systems, not just record systems, any system that can be coming into your organisation, any core business, everything's got records. We've all been saying that all day today. There are records everywhere. Be part of it. Educate. Educate with inspiration. Don't try and manipulate them. Don't try and tell them that you've got to do it because it's compliant. Right? People hate it. I know you said talk about the carrot stick, but they don't, they don't really care, let's be honest. They don't care about the compliance. It's not their thing. They just want to get their job done. Demonstrate your passion. If you're passionate, 
you'll win them. I sat and listened to, uh, not long ago to a guy spoke, speaking about, I couldn't believe I listened to this, nuts and bolts. I couldn't believe that I actually got involved in this conversation, but he was so passionate about the conversation, about the topic, sorry, that he had me, right? And I actually listened and I watched and I enjoyed and I learned. So be passionate. Get out there. Avoid sales pitches. As I said, non-compliance, increased productivity. Is that not a joke? Seriously? And we, and we know it does, but prove it. Where's the tangibility? Where, how can you say to your manager that I'm going to put in a new system and I'm going to increase productivity by 30%? He goes, yeah, what are they going to do their time now? Or how are you going to prove that? What else are they going to do with that 30%? So you've got to be, you've got to be mindful about how you sell, this, how you sell your um, product. Becoming digital. Oh, that's another boring one. Yeah, we're all digital. It's true. It's, it's, not a, it's not a business case. It's not a business case benefit. Becoming digital. We are digital. We just need to manage it better. What's in it for me? Does it benefit the team? Tell stories. Tell the stories where organisations have been saved by effective records and information um, and archives. And stop trying to make your colleagues into records managers. Why do we undersell our profession? Why do we believe that everybody out there in New Zealand can do what we do? Can I ask? Do we, do, who's got devolved systems out here where we, we ask everyone to classify and title and all that sort of stuff? Who does all that? Yep. Yeah. Are they good at it? Yeah. I like the answer. Anyone else? Are they good at it? Anyone? Unley. Oh, no, I don't know your name. I'm sorry. I know where you're from, though. Are they good at it? Oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I'd have to cross it. They were dreadful to begin with. But it's taken a lot of um, interaction, engaging, training, listening, yep. and, um, you know, giving them the tools to be able to tackle it and not find it onerous. So it's about... Yep. Listening again. Yeah, listening, empathetic. Yeah, but they're not good at it. We're good at it. It's our what we do. We're it's a skill. You are special people. You have a niche skill. Why do you try and palm it off onto everyone else? I don't understand. I, can't, I mean, I know they should. They have to do some things we can't do at all. But what I'm saying is, they're not experts at it. You are, and you need to sell yourself that way. You need to tell management that you are. You have the skill. Sell your skill. It's important. Educate, make training sexy. Who knows the movie? Clueless. See the ladies over here, don't they? Um, <laughs> interactive, storytelling. As I said, tell the truth. Don't just say, sit here, press this, do that, move there. That, that's, that, that's boring. It's really boring. Make it pertinent, punchy, specific to the audience. How many times have you been to training and they give you an example in the training session that's got nothing to do with your area? It's completely separate. Right? It doesn't mess it. You turn off. That's for HR. That's for finance. It's not for me. You need to make it pertinent. I know this makes it more time consuming and you don't, I mean, as in resource heavy, but it makes, it makes it more effective. If you spend time on resources now, you spend less time on resources later. Really good point. Thank you, Susan. I totally agree. I also meant blended learning, and that's a great one, but blended learning in the, red, in the sense of virtual, in person, online, the whole lot. So, what was your name? Katrina. Katrina. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of a. Teams for individual teams 
the moment I think all yep. this stuff, it, you lose it. Yeah, you lose it. It's not sexy. Combining it all together, you're saying it got lost, Katrina, putting it more into one. Yeah, <laughs> that's okay. Transparency is great. Seamless. It's fine. Um, positive outcome based training has been one of my most success where they actually walk away with tangible in their hand. So that you actually do training where there might be there might be a particular issue, might be an archives issue or something like that, and they actually utilise their own um, information and we deal with it and you walk away with something so they can continue on. So it's really good. Okay, what is our value? I know I'm running on time, sorry, Andrew. Um, without effective information, we say this all the time, right? These are the things we talk about all the time, so I'll stand back. What effective information management in the organisation will be unable to locate required information, unable to secure sensitive and personal information, silos, inconsistent service, blah, blah, blah. We know this is our value, but do they care? Do they care? But we know this is the truth, right? These are all the, the, the words that we should be using and we should be getting the message across, but it doesn't. So you have to, you have to create value. Who knows this movie? Yeah, I was at Nancy, I knew that you see the diamonds. Create value. Provide solutions and not problems. Do you know what records managers or information managers are really good at? Saying no. We say no a lot. Oh, can we do this? No. Are, you, are we allowed to do that? No. Are we allowed to go and put that over there? No. Right? We say no a lot. Think about it. We say no a lot and we shouldn't. We should turn around and say, what is the problem? How can we solve it together and make us and come up with a solution? But we constantly say, no, Andrew, this is my time, not yours. You've had all day. <laughs> oh, okay, go. How do we, how do we screw workshops and performance measures that are actually measurable so that the organisation can value that and actually attach that to a corporate outcome or strategic? Yep. Well, that's probably, you answered the own question by saying we probably need to do a workshop. No, I know, you know, as in we or within our organ. Oh, we, okay. Community. Ours is a community. The oh, is to develop the have you got a few hours? Or? <laughs> no, we need it. Absolutely. I totally agree. Yes, we need it. We need to spend more time on this side of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Educate, which is talked about in the benefits of effective information. Remain engaged with the business. So many times we start a project, we're going to go in and collaborate, we're going to consult, we do that, we do it once, we go back, we sit back in the basement and we don't see them again for another two years. Right? You can't do that. You've got to keep going. You've got to get out there. You've got to be in the business space all the time. You and your team, not just you, everyone. Expand your insight and contributions. I've said that outside of your comfort zone. You're not going to like being involved in a HR system or a, um, an engineering system or a, a mapping system or whatever. It's not going to be your thing. But you need to be involved in components sort of that relate to records and information management and say sorry. You need to be involved. Get yourself out of the comfort zone and get yourself involved. You might not have to be involved in the whole project, but the component of when they're talking about records and information management is when you need to be involved. Help everyone become invaluable. They need you. You're always there for them. You're there to help, okay? Be that person. Connect information management, sorry, can I read? Connect information with the values. We talked about this, the values and objectives. If you connect it up to the the overall organisational values, you've got a better shot of getting more money. Your opinion should always be sought. This is what we're aiming for. You should always, your opinion should always be sought. They should be coming to you. You should be the Ghostbusters. They should be coming to you. Information is an asset. It has a value. We've talked about that a lot today. And effective information management minimises risk. Risk is a very trendy thing going on at the moment. Hop on it. Hop on the waves that are really important. We talked about I think you said it, did you tell Andrew, find out what's the passion? No, someone said it today. What's the passion of the time? What's the CEO want? What are they answering? What are they talking about? Hop on, hop on board. We've been bad at doing that. An email came out in many, many years ago. We all know we all know. We didn't hop on board. We let it just go. It was just going to be an informal tool. And we're still catching up. 30 or 40 years later, we're still trying to catch up to how we can capture it, even capture it at all, let alone a better way. So what I'm saying is hop on the wave now. Don't let the trends pass. I know I'm getting the call. Communicate, influence and educate. Listen, we've talked about all these today. 
Select key messages and stick with them. Ask for input and feedback. Be truthful. You'll get caught out on a lie, guys. Guarantee it, you'll get caught out on a lie. So don't lie, tell the truth. Be consistent and good and bad stories. Scare tactics can work, but success stories are more inspiring in my opinion. Okay, we can see, uh, can actually demonstrate an improvement is much more inspiring to someone to listen to you than telling them that if you don't do that, it's gonna burn down and you're gonna lose everything. So scare tactics sometimes can help, but not always. You must deliver what you've said you promise you're gonna do. Please don't set expectations you cannot deliver. You'll lose their trust completely, gone. Under promise, over deliver. Ensure you have the right resources. How often still to this day are you doing projects and people are sending up someone who's in the redeployment pool, someone who's not got the job at the moment, some new junior? I'm being on it. Yeah. Well, what, and I'm not being awful, but they can't help in your project or they can't do your BAU work, which is what they're supposed to do. You need the right resources. Effective delivery will give you, your team, credibility and trust. If you can produce a project on time, and I'm not saying on time and, and within budget and with no quality, because I, I, or budget, uh, projects that are on time and in budget that don't get used are absolute rubbish. So as long as it's a project that's working and you can do that, you'll get credibility. And I'm telling you now, the next project will be even easier because they'll trust you. They know you can do it. In closing, how do we want to close the gap between how we are known now and how we want to be known in the future? And I think a good workshop or start of community practice or something needs to happen because this stuff we need to get going. Any, anywhere, that's me, Lara, any questions? Too scared now, aren't you, Sam? She's gonna come with me to the microphone. Any questions? Yeah? Is anyone inspired now to go there and tell their boss they need to be in meetings? <laughs> really, no, no passion, nothing, nothing? Yeah, thank you very much. You've been great. Thanks very much for listening. Oh, I have to. I do like a lot. Um, I, I can just relate from a data governance perspective. Um, data governance only became a thing when it ended up on the front page of the King Review with some Royal Commission or some other thing. So, you know, it took years for data governance to even become, you know, a bit of a recognised piece of work. So the message is you've got to generate value, communicate it, make sure the right people decide it's worth investing in and keep doing it and repeat it. Great messaging. Um, Look, I just wanted, just before we do the panel and then we have drinks, of course, um, just, just, to, just to reiterate, Platinum sponsor today was at Active NAV and they did the live streaming. The gold sponsor was National Archives of Australia for the panel discussion that we had earlier on. Oh, silver sponsor was Coffee Store sponsoring the data, David Fricker conversation. Um, TIMG was the lunch sponsor. QG Film Record Solutions were the prize. Your prize and so time for a panel. We're going to be we're going to keep this really tight, like twenty minutes. We want to really get out the fresh time. So. You're on the panel. You can yeah, you can go sit down. I know. I'm just going to be confused. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, yeah, sure. So the panel, the panel is the, it's actually following on from Anne's, Anne's uh, Ralph and speech. Um, totally. Uh, turning, turning conversation into action. And it's proudly sponsored by the National Archives. So I'll hand over to Nicola or Nicola? Nicola. Nicola. Apparently, I've already got one. Um, <laughs> I'm going to invite the panelists to actually join the stage. Um, so we've got Andrew Andrews, we've got Benita Kennedy, we've got David Brooks, and we've got Susan Betts joining us today. So I think I have 19 minutes <laughs> to very quickly have a conversation on how we can turn some of the conversations we've had today into action. 
Um, I did just want to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we're on today, the Ghana people, and anyone joining us um, from on the live stream from around the country acknowledge the traditional owners of their lands too. Uh, so my name is Nicola and I am the ASA president and we are coming from a range of perspectives here, I think, um, which is fantastic. So in the <laughs> effort to keep it really tight on time and delivering as we promised, we would, and I'm 